millions of years ago, a meteorite made of vibranium. Exposition about a meteorite. Meteor's position, expositionite, also decoloration. A meteorite made of vibranium struck the continent of Africa, affecting the plant life around it. Yeah, but just the plant life of Africa? I mean, wouldn't a meteorite big enough to affect an entire f***ing continent change a lot of things over the world? Until a warrior shaman received a vision from the panther goddess Bust. Who with a what now? Led him to the heart-shaped Herb, a plant that granted him superhuman strength, speed, and instincts. This plant is basically Jesus. Jesus! The warrior became king and the first black panther. Roll kitties. To keep vibranium safe, the Wakandans vowed to hide in plain sight. You know, Wakanda has the same problem as Wonder Woman's Themyscira. You're telling me that before Claw did his heist, not one asshole stumbled upon Wakanda by accident in all those years? Yeah, it's surrounded by mountains and what looks like a rainforest, but there are still flying things like airplanes, right? These two Grace Jones looking chicks. Funny joke, but Suri is soon revealed as being in on the whole undercover operation. So why would he continue the subterfuge, even after Njobu knows he's caught? This man, Ulysses Claw. Who looks remarkably the same here as he will in 26 years. Did you think that you were the only spy we sent here? To Oakland? Yeah, totally. To the United States? No, I'm not that stupid. Point is, you have been too vague in your question for my answer to matter at all. Yes, it's only 33 seconds of logos, but it's all just one logo, and that's excessive. The tiny nation of Wakanda is mourning the death of its monarch. I know we need the exposition for the people that didn't see Captain America's Civil War, but T'Challa's seriously using his incredible technology to watch f***ing BBC news. This opening action sequence is just way too f***ing dark. I can't even call the movie out for bad staging or choppy editing because I literally can't see anything. To ruin my mission. I will be crowned king tomorrow. I wish for you to be there. Wait, Nakia was on an undercover mission to take down a group of human traffickers and T'Challa f***ed it all up just so she could come to the crowning ceremony? I know it's important and but more important than busting a group of f***ing human traffickers? Carry yourselves home now and take the boy. What? I realize she herself has to get back to Wakanda for the crowning tomorrow, but our heroes are literally turning to all these just now released prisoners and saying, f***ing carry yourselves home? There's no further assistance you or Wakanda can provide? Believe it or not, this glory shot of the landscape with herds of animals running near a body of water is the least overt Lion King ripoff this movie has to offer. And that's saying something. My little sister came to see me off before our big day. Do siblings immediately identify each other as siblings anywhere else other in the movies. Just because something works doesn't mean that it cannot be improved. My dick in a nutshell. Dude, I don't care if it's his precociously brilliant sister or not. Shuri just flipped off the current prince and future king of this country in front of all these people with no repercussions. In case you confused it for London, Nebraska. I mean, seriously, does anyone need the UK part of this title card? This is the most Londony London shot ever to London. Where is this one from? Present day Ghana. Where? Well, what about this one? This eventual reveal is predicated on the fact that this museum refuses to use any descriptive cards for their priceless artifacts. Let's give the ladies some space, please. So why did they need the guys or the paramedics? There's no way the room cleared that fast. Oh, cool. I guess Claw's Claw comes with a weapon polishing setting. Okay, so the water is being drained ahead of the falls, and all these people are arriving by boat above the falls. So is there a staircase in these rock faces? Do they all rappel down? It would be definitely yada yada is how everyone actually gets to the very specific and temporary location for the crowning slash fight. The CG on these swaying people is so bad, the maker of Weebles has sued it in civil court for copyright infringement. T'Challa, the Black Panther. I'm so Super confused about one thing, how the throne of Wakanda and the title of Black Panther are seemingly linked and yet definitely not linked, because he's been Black Panther for a bit even before his dad died. And now he has to have his panther purple drank powers medically removed in order to fight for the honor of being king, upon which they will re-purple drank his ass and get his superpowers back. But he wasn't king before now, and still had powers and was out there fighting. He was Black Panthering right after his dad died in Civil War. Did his dad decide to stay king but give up the panther juice to his son? God damn it, I've written seven lines in a Word document about this and I'm still angry about it. It, but also now questioning my sanity and whether or not I'm the only one asking these questions. Did no one notice that the Jabari tribe was missing from this entire ceremony before now? I mean, it makes for a dramatic entrance, but they're definitely a part of Wakanda, and this is a pretty important day. Marvel, look, you should make a spin-off horror series about M'Baku in the clay mask. I don't know if it's the double eyes or the double mouth or the Westworld-worthy map carved into his forehead, but this is the most frightening movie character I've seen in years. As your technological advancements have been overseen by a child! <laughs> who scoffs at tradition. Okay, a few things. Technological advancements should be overseen by whoever makes them go smoothly and rapidly, which she is doing. Second, she's 17 going on 18, and almost no decent English-speaking person would call her a child. Third, you've been up in the mountains, dude. You don't get to come down after, I'm guessing, decades and start demanding sh You chose to leave and live in seclusion. Fourth, and maybe most sinful, don't all teenagers scoff at tradition. Who could not keep his own father safe. Low blow. 
especially since he and his father were way outside the borders of Wakanda, where they can't possibly control all variables. That got bombed, and dude is making it seem like T'Challa just refused to do the Heimlich maneuver on his choking father. Glory to Hanuman. Wait, who? Hanuman feels like a sudden new name we are giving glory prayers to. Where is your god now? The M'Baku had some great trash talk before the fight, but what the hell does this have to do with anything? character is close to death but is able to come back because of an inspirational shout from the audience cliche. Don't make me kill you! No, I would rather die! What the hell is T'Challa's plan here? If Umbaku doesn't yield, his ass is definitely going over the falls too. Even though he was just gored with a super heavy spear, T'Challa's chest wound isn't bleeding at all because we don't want to obscure those beautiful abs, right? Wakanda forever! And so begins the most annoying request of Chadwick Boseman's career. Just officially elected king, T'Challa has to undergo the Purple Heart Flower Ceremony in order to receive the Black Panther powers that he had prior to this but apparently had to give up after his dad died until he was officially elected king or some point is they half-assed this from the get-go. Damn, this is a f***ing MCU movie, right? So why are the effects often so lacking? They couldn't afford those wet assholes that did the Jungle Book? I know T'Challa has security with him and everything, but nobody even looks at the King of Wakanda as he walks down a busy street, let alone ask for a selfie. Glory to Bastard. She's still growing. Rhino shadowing. My king. My love. Damn, this movie has a lot of expositional greetings. And this movie does enjoy spending lots of its time G-whizzing at itself. And what are these? The real question is what are those? <laughs> sure, he's the f***ing best. The entire suit sits within the teeth of the necklace. Man, I love this Q-style tech introduction of the gadgets as much as anyone. But the use of vibranium totally bypasses explanation of how all this was developed. Like, it's basically, this is the greatest tech ever invented. Yeah, but vibranium forever! The nanites absorb the kinetic energy and hold it in place for redistribution. But really only in this movie. You'll see it in Infinity War, but only in the wide shots for some reason. Just whip it back and forth. You probably could have saved a lot of money by bypassing Lupita Nyong'o in favor of Willow Smith for this role. Eyes up, Americans. I know Nakia's a badass spy and all that, but how the sh can she tell that all three are Americans just by looking at them from across the casino? What I'm doing or not doing on behalf of the U.S. government is none of your concern. I like Martin Freeman a lot. I even have a John Watson and a Bilbo Baggins poster up in my bedroom. But could they really not get an actual American actor to play the one American that's prominently featured in this movie? Didn't I keep it under wraps that the king of a third world country runs around in a bulletproof cat suit? Despite speaking in somewhat hushed tones, this super sensitive conversation is easily hearable by anyone nearby. The king of Wakanda is here. Ross is a seasoned veteran of the sea. CIA, but he seriously still talks into his sleeve when communicating with his team. In case we didn't have enough clues about what an evil prick claw is, he doubles down on the parade of villainous black SUVs trope. You got a mixtape coming out? Actually, there is one. Yeah, I'll send you the SoundCloud link if you like. Don't forget to catch me on my Insta too, and check out my Etsy. Yes, sir. All right. How the hell does useless henchman number four know who Okoye is? Even if they're getting set up, it's not like they'd know exactly who'd be with T'Challa. <laughs> Claw fires three rounds directly into the bulletproof suitcase instead of aiming literally anywhere else. This casino fight is rad, punctuated by this glorious one shot up and back down, then back up again panning action. Bravo, movie. Mulani! Man, good thing Claw was out of bullets there, or T'Challa would have totally wasted that bulletproof suit he's not currently wearing. Wait! Which side of the road is it? For bus sake, just drive! Yeah, but that's very important information, and it takes much less time to just say, right. Keep going! Look, I know it's a preposterous superhero movie, but seriously, this works. <laughs> what the hell was this dude's plan? Sure, the bullets can't penetrate the car, but they can totally penetrate the obvious Okoye on top of the car. Wow, I must have missed the part where this Black Panther movie officially turned into a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Don't hurt me! No more! Of all the songs to have Claw sing while in custody so that we know he's crazy, you guys went with this one? Shepherds, textiles, cool outfits. It's all a front. Does T'Challa really need the secret communications device? I mean, they have a one-way mirror in this interrogation room, so why wouldn't they also be able to hear what they're saying? It powers their city, their tech, their weapons. Claw helpfully exposits this information to Ross, even though he has no incentive to do so except for getting more screen time. Hey, you really can't blame Andy Serkis for milking it there. At least he gets to show his actual face for once. Despite his injuries and taking off the mask, T'Challa impressively pulls off a flawless zoom and enhance cliche. <laughs> Even though they just relentlessly pursued Claw throughout the entire city of Busan, I guess they'll just let him go here, along with the people that own whatever weapon kicked T'Challa's ass a second ago. Nakia. But it's Ross that's dying. Why the hell would Okoye say this? Why? Give me a Kimoyo bit. This will stabilize him for now. Yeah, I'll just stick my who's what into his whatchamacallit and something something vibranium. Give him to us. We can save him. And so the CIA people just said, okay, and let him be taken back for healing to what they truly believe is a third world country. This man is a foreign intelligence operative. 
How do we justify bringing him into our borders? This is an excellent point. They haven't let anyone into Wakanda for centuries, but they have to get Ross back there or he'll die. It's not like they're inviting some random asshole that won't tell anyone. This motherfucker's in the CIA. 30 years your father was in power and did nothing. With you, I thought it'd be different. But T'Challa's only been king for like two days, and he spent most of that time chasing Claw. Give him a fucking break, man. He drew his weapon on me. I know Njobu's done some questionable but why did T'Chaka have to kill him dead? He's already disarmed him, right? This entire movie could have been 80% less conflict if T'Chaka just uses, like, a Wakanda neck pinch or something. Man, Claw looks pretty f***ing good for a corpse that's been flown from South Korea all the way to Wakanda in a tiny, unrefrigerated prop plane and then dragged across the prairie in the middle of a hot day. Don't touch anything. My brother will return soon. Wow, Everett Ross may be the first movie character in history told not to touch anything that actually doesn't touch anything. There's vibranium on those trains. There's vibranium all around us. I understand the conflict about wanting to heal Ross in Wakanda after he technically saved Nakia's life. But once he was okay, they could totally move him somewhere else other than the technological hub of the entire country. You can't let your father's mistakes define who you are. Thing my kids will be chanting at themselves into the mirror their entire lives. But also, he can, and he should, and he does, because he lets his father's mistakes eventually help define T'Challa himself as a better king, more open to the world and giving aid. His father's mistakes directly led to who he becomes and how he defines himself. Only reason I don't kill you where you stand is because I know who you are. Is that really the only reason? Like, why is Eric even really in trouble? He's got a Wakandan tattoo, so he's not trespassing. Sure, he's a little disrespectful, but that's hardly worthy of a death sentence. I found my daddy with panther claws in his chest. Record scratch? The f Wouldn't T'Chaka's claws have been part of his suit and retracted back after the stabbing? Why'd he eject the f***ing claws and leave them in the dead body? He literally said to the other guy, tell no one of this, and then I guess followed that up with, but I'm gonna leave these claws here like a riddle or some f Yeah! I'm exercising my blood right. The challenge for the mantles of King and Black Panther. Okay, but can Eric really do this? There was a whole thing earlier about the challenge being on a specific day when the other tribes declined to challenge before M'Baku. Can any one of those warriors walk in and challenge at any time? I know we in the U.S. probably shouldn't be judging any other country's politics, but that seems like an inefficient system. Also, let's talk about Killmonger's way unnecessarily complicated plan. He stole the vibranium from the museum in London just so he could get T'Challa's interest in capturing Claw in Busan. But if Claw's group killed T'Challa, Eric wouldn't have had the chance to challenge him for the throne. And why does he need all this to happen anyway? If all he's trying to do is get Chris from Get Out's support in Wakanda, he could have just killed Claw ages ago, considering he already knows where Wakanda is. And all this death, just so I could kill you. Man, and I thought my family get-togethers were awkward. Last year's Thanksgiving got nothing on this. Killmonger is at once one of our best comic book movie villains ever, and one of our stupidest. This is just so much dumb it kind of hurts the brain. Also, look, I don't know if there's a way to do this where it's not obvious, but who the f*** believes for a second that T'Challa's dead here? There's 40 minutes of runtime left. He's the titular character, and there's magic doohickeys all over the place here. Of course he survives this. Eric beat T'Challa and everything, but he also just randomly murdered Ghost Dog during the fight, who's a pretty important figure in Wakanda. Doesn't that get him in any trouble? I am loyal to the throne, no matter who sits upon it. Might be time to reassess the priorities, no? Burn it all! So thankfully she, I guess, suspected Killmonger might go all burn the witch on the purple flower and came here to grab one she intends to use to give T'Challa back his panther powers. But then after that, that's it, right? No more flowers, no more panthers after T'Challa, right? We start this throne room scene upside down as a very subtle way of reminding the audience that here in Wakanda, things are currently upside down. The new king is a <gasps> US, uh, the new king. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, tell me to stop taking all these sins off. Impossible. Dude, he's just lying there, probably dead. That's entirely possible, given the proximity of the mountains to the waterfall. One of our fishermen found him at the edge of the river border. He brought him to me. And I didn't tell anyone, like for however long it took for Killmonger to get red dirted and purple planted and then go up and change clothes and then go into the throne room and order weapons sent to the war dog spies. Yeah, I didn't say shit to anyone that whole time. I just assumed you guys would deduce that he was still alive and up here in the mountains and come here to retrieve him. And now you have! Amazing! I can heal him there! Take him. He'll be dead in seconds. Damn, everyone in this country seems to be able to diagnose and heal anyone with impunity. I love how the herb that gives a normal human superpowers is now going to serve double duty as an herb that flat out heals mortally wounded wounded dudes near death. We let the fear of our discovery stop us from doing what is right. This is the same realization Chris and I had just before starting CinemaSins. We will not help you. Character insists they won't do a thing only to change their mind off screen in a few minutes of movie time and do that very thing cliche. You know, they made it seem like Shuri ran this entire country's tech during the whole movie, and Baku even called her out in the first challenge. So how are they able to put this massive effort of the weapons distribution together without her? All that challenge is over with. I'm the king now. Get those planes in the air, king. But everyone can see T'Challa, right? And everyone knows the challenge rules. So why is everyone doing what Killmonger said? 
They can't wait for T'Challa to walk across the field. Wakabi! Man, kill this clown! This entire movie has been about Killmonger and his killing boner for T'Challa, but now that he sees he's clearly still alive, he tells Wakabi to do it. What a trap! Bambi! Boy, that escalated quickly. I know Wakabi was pissed at T'Challa for not killing Claw, but his willingness to kill what was his best friend until like a week ago is jarring. <laughs> Ah, cool. We're all gonna stop fighting and patiently wait for the over-CGI'd rhinos to show up and make this otherwise excellent movie into a sh show. Battle rhinos take this movie into full-on Lord of the Rings mode for the finale, and that's not a good thing. I made it American style for you. Get in! First off, when did Cherie have time to make this American style? And how is that even an option? And what does that even mean? It's not like the U.S. only has one type of vibranium-powered aircraft. In fact, I'm pretty sure we don't have any. <laughs> Laser paws! Okay, I know I've hit the CGI in this movie hard, and it totally deserves it, but this is just egregious. We've literally fallen into a pit of cliched darkness, with a large dose of rubber neo and a healthy amount of same versus same. You're better than this movie. You want to see us become just like the people you hate so much. Couldn't T'Challa at least mention that he's had a change of heart and wants to help the world now? Isn't that worth a shot before someone gets killed again? Would you kill me, my love? Oh yeah, remember that these two are, I don't know, dating, I guess? Because it has no bearing on anything that happens in this movie until now. Bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships. Because they knew death was better than bondage. So everything went back to normal after that enormous fight? All those Wakandans that died for the super quick rule of Killmonger are just dead? We all cool now? Once a f***ing again, the king of Wakanda, now making out on a very public street, attracts no interest from the common folk. Bucky. Even for giving the nine seconds a black screen, this logo takes up 34 seconds for one goddamn studio. Thanos supposedly kills half of a people he encounters, so is this half of what was left of Asgard? Because it looks like a whole lot more. I'm also wondering, since Asgard lost so many at the hands of Kate Blanchett in Thor Part 3, does Thanos update what constitutes 50% population of a planet? Or should we give him a pass since he couldn't possibly know the devastation Asgard just went through? The Tesseract. Or your brother's head. This two hour and 30 minute incomplete movie where Thanos locates all the Infinity Stones is only necessary so that Thanos can snap half the universe's population to death. Just so he can be lazy. All this trouble he's going through to find Infinity Stones. He could have traveled planet to planet and did this job faster. Like six years ago, when we were introduced to him in the first Avengers. We don't have the Tesseract. It was destroyed on Asgard. If Thor doesn't send Loki down into Odin's trophy room at the end of Thor the Third, does the Tesseract survive it and float around in space? And does Thanos' quest end when he realizes he can't possess the Space Stone? Does the snap only produce impotent sparks at that point? It's a hypothetical, I grant, but I'm sending it anyway. We have a Hulk. Why does Hulk hold back during the battle while Thanos destroys the Asgardian ship until the end when Loki says we have a Hulk? What the f*** was he doing before then? Thanos destroys Hulk with only one stone in his glove. Later, with many stones in the glove, his punch will be held by super angry Captain America after going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Iron Man on Titan for a good bit. And the power distribution slash comparisons in the MCU have never felt more squirrely than in this movie. Also, where's Valkyrie? Valkyrie should have at least been shouted out in this movie. Thank Odin Valkyrie got half my people away to safety, is all Thor had to say later. Just who the f*** is this guy? We've sat through 18 goddamn films, and if I'm remembering correctly, 75% of the MCU has been Thanos bitching about traffic on the freeway, and we haven't once been introduced to these powerful f***s that follow him around or why he needs them. Find them, my children, and bring them to me on Titan. Sure, put Infinity Stone Retrieval in the hands of your henchmen. That worked so well in the 39 other movies. Didn't you literally grumble, fine, I'll do it myself? Oh no, Loki's gonna die, again. Like in Thor The Dark World, which definitely means he's probably not dead. And even if he is, I'm sending it anyway, because that Dark World scene did not get sinned enough. Thanos is coming. In previous movies, we were told Hulk and Banner have different memories. So how does Banner remember shit the Hulk alone knows? Tony Stark, famous Avenger, is running around Central Park, and nobody's bothering him. This guy is more famous than any president or celebrity in history. Tony Stark? Do normal people see this sh While I know New Yorkers are up on their Avengers knowledge, I'm not quite so sure they've been informed about the masters of the mystic arts. Big Bangs and six elemental crystals hurtling across the Virgin Universe. If the universe is infinite, or at least close to it, then these stones were sent in directions that should have guaranteed no one could ever combine them all. Just based on sheer math. Also, why six? Two weeks ago, Vision turned off his transponder. He's offline. Okay, if he had a fucking transponder and knew it, he wouldn't have waited until two weeks ago to turn it off. So this is some bullshitty bullshit here. Cap and I fell out hard. We're not on speaking terms. Really? What was that letter Cap sent you at the end of Civil War then? He specifically said, if you need me, I'll be there. All these dudes are superheroes and they all sense something sinister is happening outside. But instead of instantly leaping into battle, they take several seconds to gape like children at the strange noise, like dickheads. 
The alien ship causes Peter's spidey sense to go off. And Homecoming didn't give us any indication spidey sense even existed. And now this movie is just thrusting it on me like, well, almost like they forgot it was a thing and are only now implementing it. I need you to cause a distraction. Holy <laughs> We're all gonna die! Ned, you are a treasure. Maybe none of the classmates on the bus see Peter do this, but plenty of other drivers and passengers on this bridge do. And in the age of smartphones and dash cams and government surveillance, this transition was definitely seen and captured on film and Peter's cover is blown forever. What's the matter with you kids? You've never seen a spaceship before? Yeah, sure. They've seen a spaceship, and it usually means bad things. I've seen a tornado before. That doesn't mean that when it happens, I'm going to sit on the bus reading Madame Bovary. Bring me the stone. Dude, a minute ago you were making metal fly with a flick of your wrist. Why do you even need the futuristic space act? do to do this for you. I need to concentrate for a second. Bruce's Hulk transformation troubles become an impotence metaphor. And does that mean when he's successful, it's like he's a huge green boner? And what does that say about his character? That he can only become erect when he's angry. This is the most embarrassing Mark Ruffalo's been since In the Cut. I realize that nanobots are legit real world science, to a degree, but Tony suit is applying it in ways that make it utterly unbelievable. Here's some we definitely won't use later when it could sway the fate of the universe. I mean, there are much more important and dangerous hands that this can be used for to cut off in this film. Unlock 17A. Thank f***ing God Stark had pre-designed and built and voice programmed for deployment a space-worthy Iron Spider-Man suit in the, I'm guessing, a few months since Spider-Man Homecoming? Friday, send him home. Yep. Um, why didn't the suit just fly him back to wherever Tony wanted him to go? If you're telling me that the suit doesn't fly, then why doesn't it? If the suit does fly, then there's no need for the parachute send-off, especially if you've got Friday controlling it. <laughs> Somehow after that massive battle that ended in that one park, Banner retraced his steps and found Tony's phone in the rubble. Like a needle in a haystack called and thinks you're making this too difficult. Well, this is 100% definitely not a reaction to CinemaSins complaining about text place names and movies being used when they're unnecessary. This is 100% definitely not a reaction to CinemaSins complaining about text place names and movies being used when they are unnecessary. Of all the retro references to make, Groot is playing Defender. What a f infuriating video game. Why is he even playing ancient Earth games anyway? Aren't there modern alien games to download from the nebula? That Thor is convenient and illogical, but I do love Fig Newtons. After that encounter with a sudden new alien being, Groot is still playing handheld video games. There comes a point when a parent's got a parent, and clearly no one aboard this ship ever did that. So Groot ends up like that affluenza kid in Texas, and everyone around him acts like, oh snap, he's such a bad seed, why didn't anyone do anything? He's anxious, angry, he feels tremendous loss and guilt. So basically every single American then, or even every human, aren't we all anxious, angry, and feeling lost these days? Mantis's empath revelations are more obvious than Forrest Whitaker's in Species. Who the hell are you guys? That's an awfully rude way to greet people you don't know. I once woke up in this room and this dude tried to do all this gnarly shit to me with these strange tools and I was like, who the hell are you? And he said, I'm your fucking dentist, asshole. Dr. James Packer DDS was tough, but fair. Thanos retrieves another stone. He'll be too powerful to stop. He already is. How exactly did they expect to stop Thanos, who doesn't even need Infinity Stone? Stones to be powerful, but already has two of them. Plus, Thanos needs Gamora to get the Soul Stone. Keeping Gamora away from Thanos is strategy 101, but because there's no time, they hastily conjure up some no-ass plan. <laughs> Vision and Wanda are supposedly on the run and hiding out from, I guess, the government, but this apartment or hotel room is large as f this looks like a honeymoon, not a couple on the lamb. Romancing the stone! Also, they went from kind of maybe flirty to kissy face hotel buddies and deeply in love. Entirely off screen! Look, this is the f***ing MCU. I refuse to believe anything is an accident, and I'm losing sleep trying to unravel the meaning of we will deep fry your kebab. Is it a promise? A threat? A guarantee? A cipher key? The sign is taking up way more screen space than Wanda's face. It has to mean something. How the f*** did that alien assassin sneak up on an android without being heard or seen or sensed? The plane. It stopped me from facing. That's literally the only explanation this movie's gonna give for why the two most powerful Avengers end up needing help from some punchy fools like Black Widow and no longer Captain America. Wanda is hand-to-handing this henchman. She's a magic witch that fooled all the minds of the Avengers with false visions of awful futures at once. Why does she have to throw her mind powers at people? Why did Cap need to make a dramatic entrance into this scene? And why on the other side of the tracks? Why isn't he helping already? And in the time it took both Scarlet Witch and Proxima to figure out who it was, either of them could have potentially won the fight while the other was distracted. Audience applause break. 
<laughs> Guns. These henchmen fail to get the stone they were sent after, and they peace out to save their own skin. And I'm pretty sure even they know that Thanos values the stones over his henchmen. So what the f*** are these minions thinking, bailing out like this? Stay close, check in, don't take any chances. We just wanted time. You know, to figure out the whole having sex with a synthetic vibranium body thing. It's a lot tougher than you'd think. I hope Thanos is keeping count during all this disorder and chaos, because I can't figure out how many are dying at first glance. But I'm sure he knows how to keep the death at halfsies. What's wrong, little one? The fact that Thanos would ever have stopped on his kill quest for even a moment because of a cute kid is a big pill to swallow. You're quite the fighter, Gamora. She asked a question. That's it. She's displayed zero fighter characteristics. She's inquisitive, confused, scared, guileless, but a fighter she is not. This half-genocide scene illustrates a curious character detail in Guardians of the Galaxy, when they told us Gamora was the only survivor. If Thanos gets me, I want you to promise me. One other thing you could do, just find a distant planet to live on, lay low, find a cave, maybe find Spock, and don't allow Thanos to ever get near you. Swear to me on your mother. Movie characters think that a promise will be a bond if they swear on a loved one, but of course it doesn't work that way cliche. I realize she has a hate boner of justice, but goddamn, what was she thinking? She's the one that's been reminding others how fucking powerful Thanos is. Premature self-reprobation. You knew I'd come. I counted on it. So he assumed that the Guardian ship would get the distress signal from the Statesman. They'd follow it. They'd just so happen to run into Thor. He'd tell them about the Reality Stone and that she would agree to come here? This is f***ing impossibly brilliant. He didn't even tell Thor he'd be coming here. He just told his minions to get the two stones on Earth and meet him at Titan. The only reason he pulls the trigger here is because the movie knows it's going to undo the act and keep Gamora alive for now. His love for her and dopey puppy dog nature 100% does not jive with his willfully pulling the trigger here. Why did Drax and Mantis go back to normal when Thanos leaves? The stone powers aren't proximity based, but somehow the damage he did was only temporary. This is a hologram of Ross, whose physical body is in a completely different room somewhere in the country. And yet he's able to walk around this room, like he's physically in this one. Is he in a replica room with a virtual reality display? And if so, there should be a camera somewhere in here tracking his eye movements so he can face the right way when he's talking to people, right? No one in this movie should own a Rickenbacker base and have it displayed on a floor stand in some kind of library. This guitar is the biggest lie the MCU ever told. I've played one of these. Tell me, Congressman, have you ever played a Rickenbacker base? Base. Where's the fight? F***ing Bucky. Aren't we just gonna gloss over the fact that a Stark shoulder missile from Earth easily blasts a hole in the hull of this alien spaceship? The hell is this spray stuff Tony's using here to seal the breach in the ship's hull? Nano magic? Canned convenience? It's magic whiz and it's cheesing me off. Way to introduce a new character in the movie in the 19th film of a franchise and completely kill him off in an hour. Darth Maul and Ebony Maw are now in some seventh circle of movie franchise hell, where they were told they were special and maul their fates with Maul Flanders at the Hades Mall. So I say we take the fight to him. Granted, the ship you're on is going to him, and you haven't stated declaratively that you can turn the ship around, despite being asked twice by Strange, maybe this is less of a choice than the movie or Tony wants to make it seem. Your planet was on the brink of collapse. I'm the one who stopped that. Do you know what's happened since then? I don't know. Has 50% of the planet multiplied and brought it back to pre-Thanos population numbers? I guess you plan on snapping the universe back to half its people every 20 years or so? This seems so f***ing pointless. Don't do this. Barmier! Ultimately, sisterly love is what causes her to give up the location of the Soul Stone, and therefore the fate of the entire universe. She begged her boyfriend to kill her, rather than let Thanos win. And I'm getting a new hammer. In Thor 33 and a third, Odin told him his hammer was just something that focused his power. Now that's been forgotten, and a hammer is important again. You're gonna need more than one stupid eyeball. But you're handing him a fake eyeball. So he still only has one stupid eyeball, right? What the f***? Some random computerized alien eyeball has a connection port that matches Thor's flesh-based eye socket connection port? Thor? This is a second Marvel movie to waste Peter Dinklage. And he killed everyone anyway. All except me. Let me do some math here. 300 dwarves were here, one is left, carry the 9, multiply by pi r squared, that's 99.67% of the dwarf population. Which means he must have let 299 other dwarves on some other hammer building station live. That's all well and good, but how did she get out of the mid-air suspension thing that she was in? Doesn't that thing make you, for all intents and purposes, immobile? In fact, I'm kind of wondering how she was even able to kill that guy. Wind up implanting eggs in my chest or something and I eat one of you, I'm sorry. I do not want another single pop culture reference out of you. I'm trying to say that something is coming. Really? Because there was absolutely nothing urgent about what you were saying at all. In theory, it could even summon the Bifrost. Because why not? Thor's gonna have to get to Earth faster than a ship can take them somehow. So bake in the Bifrost into this baby and we're set. What are the odds a far-flung planet moon like Titan would have air breathable by humans? 
So wait, at the end of Captain America, Red Skull touches the Space Stone and is sent into space to be a sort of keeper of the Soul Stone? It really just seems like a reason to shoehorn Red Skull back into the story more than anything that makes sense. Guiding others to a treasure I cannot possess. Are you saying you've had a lot of people looking for the Soul Stone since you got sent here in 1945? What happened before you were here? Was Warren G. Harding guiding people back then? Soul holds a special place among the Infinity Stones. Why? You might say it has a certain wisdom. But why? The stone demands a sacrifice. Why does the soul stone require so many more parameters to acquire it than any other stone? It's like the original creators of the stones themselves said, okay, if you're powerful enough to hold the other five gems, we'll let you change reality, move across space at will, increase your strength, and harness the most powerful energy in the universe, go into the past and the future, and access other people's minds. But when it comes to controlling all life in the universe, that's where we draw the line. Dude's got kind of a thing for bubbles, I see. I feel like the sacrifice of Gamora would have played a lot better if Thanos had been given his own proper origin film, and if we'd had more reason to suspect his love for her. This death is sad, until you realize that A, the Time Stone will end up figuring into her coming back to life anyway, and B, that despite all the problems since the firing of James Gunn, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 was ready to go into production after this movie. What the hell happens here? He kills her, the weather gets weird, a flash, and suddenly he's in a pool of water with a stone? How and where is there any water here anyway? It's like an ice dimension with snow. Is he not on Vormir anymore? I'm actually so confused by this cut, I suspect the next movie might hinge in some small way on it. But whatever. It's still a weird cut location change in the movie, and I shall sin it. Something's entered the atmosphere. Just one line about how Thanos or something with the stones tells him exactly where each one is would be f***ing terrific. It didn't help him at all with the Soul Stone. He needed Gamora to tell him that. So why the precision knowledge with the others? These ships hit the Earth at massive speed. I don't understand why they don't do to the planet what meteors that large would do, like in Deep Impact or f***ing Age of Ultron. And yet, they don't. They just cause little fire ripples and loud noises. This battle at Wakanda doesn't make a whole lot of strategical sense. Thanos already has enough stones to wreck these Earthlings on his own. He needs Vision Stone. That's basically the only reason he sends this army. Feels like we needed something action-y to do with a bunch of our characters that didn't make the trip to Titan, and we came up with this. I'm gonna hold it open. That's suicide. So is facing Thanos without that axe. Okay, dude, you f***ing had a magical hammer made by this guy at this place, and your sister smashed it like it was chocolate. I take offense to the idea that an axe from here could defeat Thanos and the fact that it nearly does. These Star Wars-esque kid-style troop transports are super inefficient in that only 20% of their surface area can hold troops. <laughs> Look at that distance between the shield and the Wakandan troops that everybody, including Natasha, just traversed in three seconds. And that pissing match confrontation at the shield was 100% unnecessary to the story and the battle. Oh good! Just what I wanted to see in this giant Marvel movie. Swarms of easily killable CGI monster clones. Thanos could easily just do the job right now, but why do that when you can reenact Braveheart? They went to the trouble of showing him getting a Wakandan-made vibranium arm, and in battle all we really see him do is fire a machine gun. I'm no War Machine fan, but this shit looks hella useful, and he should just do that all battle long. You open the barrier. In order to keep the aliens from going around and flanking them, they open the f***ing shield barrier directly in front of them. And honestly, it's one of the most baffling military decisions on film since Denzel started firing on friendly tanks and courage under fire. Why not leave Cap and you and Falcon and War Machine here to get the stragglers getting through one at a time and send the entire rest of the army to the back to fight the alien foot soldiers? I love how they both leap in here punching, like they somehow know these aren't aliens with poison skin or acid blood. There are frogs here on Earth that have poison skin. Also, say, why didn't Thanos staff his army with aliens that had poison skin or acid blood? A bunch of whatever. If Thor can withstand the energy of a star, then what can kill him? It's almost like this movie is saying all that stuff that could have killed Thor in the other movies. Well, forget all that, because he can take the brunt of a star's energy, because this movie really needs him to. Groot finally looks up from his video game. And don't tell me it's because he cares about Thor. The movie just needs him to get involved here in a second. Teenagers do not act moody for a long time and then suddenly sacrifice a limb for a creepy stranger they bumped into a couple days earlier. I think he's dying. He needs the axe. Why? He's not the god of axes, is he? So now he and the weapon are one because he helped create it. I thought he and the hammer were one, but ultimately that hammer didn't matter. And he didn't help make the hammer either. My point is these movies give zero fucks about how the magic space weapons wielded by gods work or don't work. Audience applause break. How the f*** did Thor know where to go once he got his new axe? Why'd he go to Earth instead of Titan? Why not New York or Norway? Thor doesn't even know Wakanda exists, does he? Bad CGI floating head Bruce gives me nightmares. And when we faced extinction, I offered a solution. Genocide. But random, dispassionate, fair to rich and poor alike. You know what would be awesome, since the Death Snap doesn't discriminate, if it killed Thanos too. 
Imagine Thanos actually deciding for the greater good that he could even die with such a snap. But guess what? You don't have the balls for that. With all six stones, I could simply snap my fingers. They would all cease to exist. Why though? Why a snap and not an okay sign or salute or a middle finger or the shocker? I feel like with just the four stones he currently possesses, he could easily end this fight right now. The guy can currently manipulate all the energy in the world, reality itself, and let's not forget, control all life in the universe with three of those stones. Don't let him close his fist. What? He can't use the stones if he doesn't close his fist? Since f***ing when, movie? And f***ing why, movie? Honestly, for a bunch of all-powerful when they're combined together magic space gems, the infinity stones are super restrictive. <laughs> That punch somehow doesn't kill Peter. God damn, that was a punch. This fucking guy. How can all these superheroes be so emotionally wound up to make the same fatal mistake when they hear about losing their loved ones? Yeah, sure, it's within his character to do this, but I'm sending the movie that this is the reason why Thanos escapes. Mantis is thrown several hundred feet away from Thanos. Spidey reacts to this and apparently can jump said amount of feet before Mantis lands. Well, he finally answers the question I have never asked about what happens when a film character uses a Bruce Almighty Moon as a projectile. And I've got to say, I should have asked this question years ago. But also, everybody survives the Moon's meteor shower. So you can see the bind I'm in. I know we like him. And she loves him. But honestly, kill his ass and destroy the stone, you idiots. The universe is at stake. Not once during this battle do we see if they're making any real progress against these CGI nothings. Just a bunch of quickly edited fights that act as filler until Thanos gets here. Sure, it's kind of cool to see Bucky pick up Rocket and perform a 360 death ballet. But in the end, who cares about this stupid army? It's like watching the Harlem Globetrotters beat the Washington Generals while Michael Bay coaches both teams. After Thor's arrival where he thunder Grudaxed everyone, seeing him punch foes one at a time here makes me wonder why he doesn't just keep doing that first thing. Your haircut? Notice you've copied my beard? Good thing there's no one to fight for a few seconds so we can have a humorous exchange about hair. F***ing dicks. Why was she up there all this time? Because Scarlet Witch was there to destroy the Mind Stone as Shuri got it out of vision. Jeez, lady, who do you think you are? You're worse than cinema sins. I'm not saying I like the Wakandan battle rhinos. I'm just saying they would have been super useful in this battle. Vision ex machina! He should be vomiting magenta computer code at this point, but somehow he has the strength to stand, grab a weapon, and kill a fool. Come on, movie. Have just 25% more consistency, damn it. Holy sh! This fight between Strange and Thanos is, first of all, amazing as f. I'll take off two sins for it. But also, it's so evenly matched for so long that it makes the group fight against Thanos that came before it seem silly and wimpy and underwritten. So Iron Man's shield can apparently withstand that. Good to know. It's not like these stones are the most powerful f***ing objects in the universe or anything. Cap, that's him. <laughs> like, that arrival needed some kind of narration or verbal confirmation. I understand my child better than anyone. You could never. If we're about to see a reenactment of Spike Lee's old boy here, I'd only like to see one specific scene. The Soul Stone is the only one to demand a sacrifice so you understand its power. But the Mind Stone is the largest one and takes up the leader position of all the stones in the glove. Honestly, should anything be able to defeat that glove right now? Let alone a new axe that we only just learned about? We now interrupt this Avengers movie to bring you a special presentation of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, starring Josh Brolin as Dumblemore. Here comes the part of the movie where the snap of death plays a game. Who's gonna live and who's gonna die? And apparently it takes its time picking and choosing because all the dramatically relevant deaths wait for each other so we can see them all rather than happening at the same time. Also, his gun stays solid, but the new vibranium arm turns to dust? <laughs> While it's distressing to see your favorite characters wasting away, don't you just know they're all going to be back? This kind of death scene is reminiscent of Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2, where the movie stages a free-for-all with death galore, only to show us that it was a vision. Like a new chapter of Final Destination with sexy vampires. It has emotional impact as an idea, but absolutely none because you know it will be reversed. There was no other way. Glad you could mention this just before you waste away into nothing. I hear the snap loves letting people have final words before they go. Geez, did Thanos move out into Camazots or whatever the fuck that was in A Wrinkle in Time? You know what that means! Chris Pine is gonna complete the Chris Quad Fecta in Avengers 4! Woohoo! I guess it's a good thing Nick Fury always carries around his Captain Marvel X Machina pager with him wherever he goes, and that the snap waited for him to use it. I still think about the night your mother and I had to leave you. Pinration over an uncaring void of darkness. Look, Hollywood, no matter how realistic the de-aging technology gets, it will always feel uncanny, because our brains know it's fake, and we know what they look like now. And I just wish you'd stop. Is anyone really trying to tell me that Batman Begins would have been better if young Bruce Wayne was a CGI de-aged Christian Bale a la Newsies instead of a totally different child actor that didn't maybe look like Bale but did the job acting wise? We both knew that if you go that small, 
There's no coming back. Narration that was proven false by the previous movie. And this movie. In a few seconds, he's even going to counter this very statement. So why not just have him say, we both thought. It should have been me. That my regulator was damaged. And that would mean these movies would have had Michelle Pfeiffer as one of the leads. And God forbid a woman be the successful inventor of scores of useful Marvel tech. I imagine Marvel being like Buddy Ackerman's office and swimming with sharks. Avoid women. They ovulate. Do you know what that does to a three-month shoot? You've got to think big. Think Pym. Think Banner. Think Stark. Ah, bad wigs. I think it's possible to bring her back. And I started to think it's possible to make pigs fly, but I've still got several legal and moral hurdles to clear before any country will give me permission to cut off a pig's nose and surgically attach a propeller in its place. I'm ready, Daddy. This reveal is cute until you realize that he was in jail for stealing, and now he's play-acting stealing with his kid, and then it gets a little less cute. Look, it's Anton. Looks like Scott saw Dave made a maze, so therefore Scott made a maze. It looks like treasure. I want to take it to show and tell. But why? So that there will be a five minute sidetrack later in the movie where he has to go into the school to get it back? That's awfully prescient for a 10 year old to think about a screenwriter's wishes. I'm in the middle of trying to steal something with my daughter. He even says the word steal. How many conversations did he have with her where he was all stealing for real is wrong and that's why daddy went to jail. But stealing for pretend is fun so let's do that together in celebration of the fact that daddy isn't in jail for stealing anymore. Everyone's gonna call this the he's a great dad scene but if she'd flown off this cardboard slide contraption and gotten a concussion we'd all be rightfully blasting his ass as a terrible and reckless father. You're really great with kids. Thanks, I'm also a youth pastor. Pop quiz, assholes. Thanks, I'm also a youth pastor is A, what I say whenever I get complimented on my hygiene, B, a spicy Albanian religious cola drink, C, a saying I had tattooed on my penis, and D, the only sworn testimony I have ever given in a court of law. It was their tech, so they violated the accords, too. How does creating tech like Ant-Man's suit before the accords were a thing violate the accords? I thought the accords were just a set of rules stating that superheroes had to twiddle their thumbs until the government needed them to fight crime under their supervision. If it was discovered that Scott stole the tech, how does that make Hank and Hope liable. How'd you do it, Scott? He means the magic trick, but this is the pronoun game dressing up as something else. Look, I'll be honest, these Ant-Man movies deserve praise for portraying a modern family that includes divorce and stepdads without making it feel weird. In fact, these movies go out of their way to show how uplifting and positive co-parenting can be for divorced parents. Once in removed. This guy has three more days of house arrest to kill before freedom, and he goes, drum practice, plastic bowling even six-year-olds would turn up their noses at, goddamn magic lessons online, private karaoke, John Green novels, origami, and hot f***ing goddamn is the dude ever gonna turn on the TV or watch some porn? Nothing passes time better than TV and porn. You always find me, mommy. This is apparently a real life memory of some sort because blah blah Scott blah blah quantum realm blah blah married to the mob is stuck in the quantum realm. And that's pretty much how this movie explains it. Do you think it was a dream or is it possible that you really saw my mom down there? How the f is he supposed to know that? I have a feeling that if you were driving a car this small for a trip this long, getting smashed would be an inevitability. Also, while the car is small, it's not undetectable. People would see this tiny car making intelligent driving decisions and definitely pick it up and see what the f is going on. It was a matter of national security. The cap needed help. So. Cap? Hope interrupts this bullshit reason Scott is giving to join Cap's side in Civil War, basically because it's a joke about how he casually refers to Captain America as Cap, and so you won't realize what a ridiculous decision it was. The whole first Ant-Man was about him doing things to see his daughter, because he cared about his daughter more than anyone in the world. To join the fight with a bunch of rogue Avengers and potentially be put in prison for life is something not only Scott wouldn't do, but Cap would never ask him to do under those circumstances. What? I barely tolerate your embiggening and smallening technology at all, but simply can't abide the idea that you built it into a f***ing car model. Also, is there a reason you drove here small only to park large? Was it just to demonstrate the tech? I think it was just to demonstrate the tech. Okay, these giant ants roaming around like worker bees or mailroom employees here? They can f*** off and die and I am so uncomfortable right now. Also, these CG ants are fake as doesn't Marvel Disney have enough money now to actually enlarge real ants and train them at this point? I'd for sure wreck the ecosystem for art. Why doesn't this multi-billion dollar company? No, seriously, are you paying these ants a living wage? Because if not, this feels way ickier than a shared understanding between species. It's a tunnel to the quantum realm. Wait, what? You don't need a tunnel. Just wear the suit and go two levels deep. Boom, Bob's your uncle. You're in the quantum realm. Try the veal. This huge Duracell product placement only accentuates what a waste of science this is. You could solve nearly all the world's problems with this shrinking and enlarging technology, but it will never be used in that way. We think when you were down there, you may have entangled with her. And so therefore, you had a dream memory of a very real thing that happened. I don't understand it either, but thankfully it happened because now the pan's back together and we can start ant-manning the wasp. Your mom put a message in my head? Come on. That's insane. Guy who has literally shrunk down and led an army of ants into battle says that's insane. Like he's some kind of authority on crazy scene descriptions. Once we get the component and power up the tunnel, we'll get the message and have you home by lunch. We have to hurry, the entanglement won't last. You owe us. Never, ever, ever have six seconds of consecutive dialogue been this confusing. If you're trying to keep your shrinkable lab a secret, why do you place it anywhere in the middle of the city? In fact, why don't you just always keep the building shrunk, then shrink to go inside it and do your work, and only enlarge when you need it to be enlarged? I mean, does no one see this sh 
And what about the electrical and plumbing lines into this bitch? Not to mention all the four dozen other issues this movie ignores about shrinking a building. Also, I hate you. Also, also, how is the solution to Infinity War not these fools just making Thanos a tiny gummy bear and eating his ass so he drowns in stomach acid? Can I have one of these? No. He could simply tell Scott that there are no Altoids in that box, but why do that when you have this big surprise up your sleeve later when they get all kidnapped by Ghost? Walton Goggins plays a bad guy in a movie cliche. Quantum energy is the future. <laughs> okay, this is like when the human guy in Avatar demanded more unobtainable. It's literally just like that. We look the other way because the MC was great, but still. You know what's cooler than a million dollars? One billion dollars. Hold up, what is that on the plate in front of her? Bars of Dove so cut open and filled with goop? Giant deviled eggs? The three seashells from Demolition Man? Hope is now kicking all of Birch's henchmen's asses, which makes me wonder why she or Pym didn't just shrink down, break into wherever it was, and steal the component in the first place. Why did they even stick their necks out when they were already wanted for their supposed Sokovia Accords crimes? Hell, Pym is such a genius, why didn't he just build it himself? The motherfucker built a goddamn quantum tunnel! Alright. All right, I am out. This kind of tech makes pretty much the entire MCU worthless. This is raw magic, more powerful than even Harry fucking Potter ever saw. Also, I just don't understand why she would need to do that when she's perfectly capable of speedily flying to the door to prevent him from doing that herself. It's like those X-Men Quicksilver scenes, only without regard for the viewer's equilibrium or desire not to throw up. Fight scene editing, brought to you by the MCU. Well, there is one place I can think of. No, 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 no! We all know what that means, people. They're going to the place that Hank doesn't want to go to anyway, despite his strong objections. It's one of those hilarious things that crops up in four out of every five movies. These assholes who work with Luis, and even Luis himself, argue about f***ing oatmeal for 20 seconds. And somehow, people were still wondering why this movie didn't fully connect with viewers. Oh. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? No lie, I literally wrote this exact thing as a sin. Then he says this, and now I have to delete that earlier sin and make this a Scott would be excellent at cinema sin sin. Wait, you might be able to improvise that tracker if you modify the diffraction units on one of your regulators. That sounds just vague enough to work. The postal service is very reliable. You know, they do tracking numbers now. This movie is just one conversation like this after another, and it's not cute. I looked everywhere, it's not here. And I put it back after Cassie and I were playing. Show and tell. Yep, Scott's going to go to Cassie's school and get the Ant-Man suit out of the trophy she brought to show and tell. He will do it with virtually no conflict. This teacher will ask for a hall pass and will give up when Scott runs away. And Cassie's class will be out to recess when he looks through Cassie's back. child size Paul Rudd sounds a lot more fun than this scene ends up being. And that's a shame. What are we going to do? Convenient lost and found bucket in a janitor's closet and not the principal's office is convenient. Okay. Go. And even though the bell rang, Scott and Hope run out of the elementary school without anyone noticing. In fact, is this a field trip day or something? Sorry, I had to come up with the name for my aunt. I'm thinking Ulysses S. Gr Amp. Another casualty of Hank Pym's ego. Dun dun dun. In addition to being super helpful about how they could locate the lab, Morpheus is also the surrogate father for this ghost chick. The odds are astronomical. Holy Elias Starr. They were colleagues at S.H.I.E.L.D. Quantum research. This exposition is clunky, but at least no one's quipping about oatmeal or the post office. When I woke up, my parents were dead. But I wasn't because quantum reasons. And trained me to be a stealth operative. We find out later that she only gets away from S.H.I.E.L.D. once S.H.I.E.L.D. falls apart. So she must have been so stealth that we didn't even see her in the big Avengers missions where she could have been a huge asset. She's in there somewhere, damn it! I just know she is! And in exchange for my soul, they were going to kill me. God, she has been talking for 57 minutes. Then she told me about Lang and the message from Janet inside his head. <laughs> Bill is giving very important information here as the story builds a little momentum and the movie interrupts it for a joke. I bring it down. I lock it in. I was going to say Hank is a dick to these ants, but then I realized Hank is just a dick. Going subatomic isn't something you can prepare for. It kind of melts your mind. If Hank's wife isn't a completely changed woman after being in the quantum realm for 30 years, then this whole thing's a lie. Oh, is that truth serum? There's no such thing as truth serum. That's just nonsense from TV. Usman and the ex-con security team will argue about whether they should call this truth serum for some time. And the reason why Usman won't just let it go is because... Why exactly? Is he trying to guard some reputation for the bad guy underworld where truth serum is considered hack? I tolerate a lot of the things you do out there, but I won't be a part of anything like that. Wait, what exactly has she been doing besides following Hank and Hope for the last two years. Has she been committing other major crimes other than stalking? Sure, she was an operative of S.H.I.E.L.D. for a hot minute, but that wasn't her decision. I like a good story as much as the next person, but what in the hell does this have to do with where Scott Lang is? I'm getting there, I'm getting there. You put a dime in him, you gotta let the whole song play out. It's really an excuse for the movie and Luis to tell his drunk history style stories again. And while those are funny and everything, I bet if you took out all the sidetracks in this film, the movie would be 50 minutes long. Oh, the woods. 
The what? Ghost decides to blow her cover to demand more specific answers, as if Birch wasn't going to ask Luis to elaborate on what he meant by that. If that freak gets Pam's tech, I'm never gonna see it. How many bad guys are in this movie? Systems in the green. Priming the coils. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. It's shutting down. Maybe our vectors are off. Yep, I agree. Gotta be the vectors. Like 60% of the time, it's the vectors every time. I'm sorry, I don't know how much time I have. I need to fix the algorithm. This is where the movie goes from harmless, inconsequential Marvel entry to downright silly. Michelle Pfeiffer's quantum brain possessing Paul Rudd is an entanglement so unwelcome they might as well call this movie I Could Never Be Your Woman Part 2. I'm Jelly Bean. <laughs> this plot convenience is so weird that now Hope can officially say she's had sex with her mom. You have two hours. After that, the probability fields will shift and it'll be another century before they align like this again. A detail that comes out of nowhere. I guess they were lucky they got the machine up and running when they did. This shit is totally made up so that there will be added pressure, even though they just sat around letting Michelle Pfeiffer waste away in the quantum realm for 30 years with no problem. The feds? They know where you are. And despite that, they will somehow totally fail to get to Scott's house before he does. Even though Goggins told the FBI guy about it sometime at night, and it's now sometime during the day. See the night in the background? That's night. But continuity aside, even if it only happened five actual minutes ago, the FBI would be at Scott's place way before his flying ant could get there from the Muir Woods. I'd also like to point out that the Muir Woods is a tourist attraction, and placing a giant lab in the middle of it is going to be spotted by somebody, even if the FBI wasn't tipped off by Sonny Birch. It's also kind of a dick move. No other members of law enforcement see this Benedict Arnold take the lab and put it in his trunk. Agent we will see you in an hour. The FBI leaves these two internationally wanted criminals in this basic ass room unsupervised. Two people known for inventions that make people small and can potentially escape the situation. Even if you search them, don't Hank and Hope deserve a stronger holding cell with guards? Yep, they're getting out of this because she has a hairpin in her mouth. People in charge of Hank and Hope are dumber than the ones who were supposed to watch Ted Bundy in Colorado. To shrink that wall. It looks load bearing. How would the shrinking device know to shrink the entire wall? Wouldn't it just shrink the one brick to which it attaches? That'll work. It's stupid, but it'll work. Look, just because the building's been placed in a nearly abandoned part of town doesn't mean people don't notice shit like that. Fucking cops who patrol this area are gonna be like, damn, a whole new building just sprung up out of nowhere. I better investigate. What's up? <laughs> He's no Ned, but Luis is definitely great and worthy of a sin removal. I had him follow us. I, I thought we could use some help. That's why I didn't tell you until now, right before we go into the lab. I just wanted to save Ava. She's facing death or something far more terrible. What? I still don't understand how the ants gained super intelligence just because they got big. Holy sh this movie just got a lot more time cop than I think it intended to. So she's a super genius, a badass at hand-to-hand -hand combat, a professional stunt driver. She's basically all the things. She's Trinity in the Matrix movies, downloading new skills on a fly as needed. I want that lab, boys, whatever it takes. Do you have all your evil black SUVs equipped? Good, that's half the battle. Any reason why she can't just do this and stay small until she finds a safe place? Can't she just shrink and hide the van, pull out the Hot Wheels rally case, change cars, thereby evading Birch and his crew? Awesome! The Quantum Realm has whale songs. Bikes, it's all you. Yes, because they took out four SUVs, the clear solution is motorcycles. Also, why the f*** were you holding back some of your men for a second wave? Do you want the lab, or do you want an extended chase? Look, I don't hate fun. I like fun, and this is fun. It's just the ramifications of this casual application of Biggie Smalley technology across the MCU as a whole concern me greatly. I'm beginning to think when screenwriters write big Hollywood movie, there's a space already filled in where crazy happens and average citizens don't see it on page 84 somewhere. You have to include it, or Cary Grant busts out of his coffin to eat you. He hasn't driven in two years, and it was a problem, but he's able to just knee skateboard this bitch like he's been knee skateboarding trucks his whole life. Huh, legit did not think you could crash down here. Darren Aronofsky's Wreck-It Ralph. Good job, Hope. Now hopefully they don't wreck the car into innocent people. Whew, I'm very results oriented, so that was a great decision on your part. Great job. How did he even have time to buy a ticket? Impossible action is justified through a throwaway joke, I guess. I'm no extra dimension expert, but I feel like the quantum void should have the same helmet removal as bad rules as outer space. I'm so sorry. He means about marrying Catherine Zeta-Jones while his first wife was trapped in the quantum realm. I'm not the same woman I was 30 years ago, Henry. Yes, you are. Just because you say it doesn't make it so. Aside from some ET powers that we'll see later, you're the same person. Adaptation is part of it, but some of it is evolution. How are you not dead? Like, I get that because you're so small, metabolism probably isn't a factor, so you don't need to eat anything, but we saw the tardigrades going in for an attack earlier, and then there's the whole mind-melting thing, in addition to other issues. But really, I just wanted to write a sin that said tardigrades in it. 
Let's go. If you've never seen a movie before, allow me to spoil for you the fact that the FBI man will, at least one more time in this movie, be too late or get fooled again. Just FYI. I'm cynical enough about the citizens of San Francisco in this movie that they probably didn't even see this. Let's go see our daughter. Truly, this has been a fantastic voyage. Come on. Come on, where are you, Scott? Gotcha. You are in dirty water with no light, trying to find a guy who is ant size. How lucky is this? I guess this is where we say adios, amigo. That's super racist. Also, ex con, ex machina. Ex conmica? Comic con? There it is. She's stealing her chi. She started the extraction. She's gonna tear mom apart. I'm sure they explained how Ghost was gonna zap Janet's quantum energy and put it into her to fix her condition. And I'm sure the idea is complex, but it ends up feeling way too simplistic. This is Paul Simon's favorite scene in the entire MCU. Your pain. And that was how Mantis was born. Scott Lang's house in this market could easily sell for a few million dollars, but earlier he and Luis were revealed to be lying to their employees about how broke the company is. No one will be seated during the everything worked out so well for everyone we are literally using the song come on get happy under this montage portion of the movie. When I see Hank take a mansion out of a jewelry box and plant his home on a beach with his beautiful wife, I'm reminded how assholish this looks, considering all the people he could help with this technology and won't. Great, but don't flush those toilets, y'all. I hate that moth dust. Given the potential for all kinds of death and danger scenarios when a human being is the size of an ant, like the moth dust and getting stepped on and drowning in a single drop of rain. Why not just watch this on a TV inside? Drive-in theaters aren't even a good way to watch a movie. As an experience, yes, they are fun and can be nostalgic and create memories, but from a pure movie-watching standpoint, it's pretty far down the list of desirable ways to watch a film, just below edited for television and just above on a handheld black and white portable TV. And don't get sucked into a time vortex. We won't be able to save you. How did you avoid the time vortex when you yourself did not know what one was until you spent 30 years in the quantum void. I have a lot of questions about how you survived down there. Also, this is foreshadowing for Endgame that is trying very hard to just appear to be casual techno babble. Remember when he went into the quantum realm in just the suit in the first movie? And then in this movie, they had to build a whole inner spaceship to use to go into the quantum realm to rescue Janet, who had also entered their quantum realm in a suit, but now they're just sending Scott back into the quantum realm in only a suit. This confuses my ass. Guys. Guys. So there were four of them here on top of the parking garage, he goes into the quantum realm, Thanos snaps, and somehow random 50% death across the universe results in all three up here getting dusted? That seems more driven by story than randomness. I'm sorry, and yes, I know it's perfectly within the realm of coincidence, but I'm not buying it here, because they need Scott to be trapped in the quantum realm in order for Avengers Endgame to resolve, so they had to dust everyone up here that could have brought him back. A drumming ant. Aren't you glad you waited the full 10 minutes of credits to see that? Are you not entertained? Never much like the Stan Lee cameos, and definitely don't don't like logos, but shit, man, this is goddamn touching. Four sins removed. But while we're on the subject of opening logos for movies, let's frame it this way. Imagine buying the new Taylor Swift album, but before you can hear me, ee -e, you have to first listen to 20 seconds of a Universal Music Group audio jingle. It would probably be rocking and full of tight harmonies, but it would still forever be 20 seconds of noise standing between you and your music. That's what opening studio logos do for movies. Why is my hand so angry? I like how they give us the name of the city, the description of that city's importance, and then a third line with an utterly incomprehensible series of letter and number characters. Do you know what time it is? Jesus, Marvel movies, young Dumbledore, young Pope, Sherlock Holmes, is there any beloved institution that Jude Law hasn't infiltrated? Anything new? No. Funny, I was thinking the same thing about this chatty, friendly fight scene, which happens in every f***ing movie. There's nothing more dangerous to a warrior than emotion. Not even a nuclear weapon? A landmine? A sharp sword? A sniper's bullet? Jagged rocks? Meat from a plant that once had an E. coli outbreak? Control your impulse. Stop using this, start using this. There's so much goddamn pedantic mansplaining in the beginning of this movie that I fast forwarded to the end where Carol blasts the out of Jan Rog and watched it three times in a row. Future VR requires artificial tendrils that get to know you better than your spouse. Just because it looks kind of cool doesn't make it practical. So the Burrito Supreme searches your thoughts and becomes the person that you're closest to before communicating? I mean, Contact got murdered for doing that at the end of the movie. Solar. The scrolls have invaded yet another border planet. This time, Torfa. Already lost me, dude. If you think for one minute I'm getting all this down, plus the three or four other names, organizations, planets he mentions in this briefing, you sadly overestimate my ability to give a Aqua Marvel. Do you read me? Does anybody copy? As technologically advanced as they are, the Kree are apparently still relying on 1990s cell phone reception. This is some dusty fuckery. Dust things. Suspense? I'm no expert, but maybe if you spent less time screaming, you'd be able to do more scrolling. No one will be seated during the bunch of bullshit portion of the movie. Some stuff is happening. Just try and keep track of the purple and the green. They're on different sides, I think. Movie does a great job advertising the Air Force. You don't belong out here! I'm strong enough! 
You'll kill yourself. The movie does pile on a bit heavy with this stuff about her constantly being told she's not good enough. I get that people are told that, but in movie form, maybe we don't need to see it a dozen times to get the point. Okay, fine. We need some backstory on why Carol's so driven to be the best. But this exposition brain probe really feels more like a Nike commercial than an MCU film. Look down. Focus. Wait, can you change the way the camera of your memory tilts so that you can pick up fine details? This is like the zoom and enhance cliche, but for your brain. Dr. Wendy Lawson, that's her. Do you hear that Do too? Have... So Carol can hear the scrolls that are digging around in her memories? And she, in memory, reacts to it? You can't change an event by remembering it, right? Right? She got knocked out cold and captured on that planet with a single blast of one of these space tasers. Now she's impervious to them. It's not exactly full size, so I guess we can call this a little helm scream. In case you thought this movie's 90s references were gonna be subtle, she crash lands into a f***ing blockbuster. <laughs> huh? Movie's playing this as a visual gag, but was Carol seriously gonna immediately shoot any non-threatening presence in this environment? What if this were the janitor doing the late night cleaning? This top shelf here goes Hudsucker Proxy, Hook, something else that I'm pretty sure is Hamburger Hill, then First Night, then Jumpin' Jack Flash, Junior, and f***ing Just Cause? I worked at three different blockbusters in my lifetime, and you get fired for this you have one job. And I think half these movies on the shelf star Sean Connery and Arnold Schwarzenegger. How likely in 1995 is it that a blockbuster would be advertising Babe with a giant poster and standee when that was only released in August of that year? It sure as f wasn't coming out on video at this point. Honestly, We Take Care of Those Dirty Looks is quite simply the worst dry cleaning advertising slogan I could even fathom. Why does a dry cleaning service even need a slogan? Wouldn't you be better off just writing your hours of operation? Talk about some nuclear yada yada. How the hell does outdated 90s tech and a payphone turn into a communicator? With the ability to send signals to her people millions of miles away in space. Hold it before. Sure, she could make a space phone out of that, but she couldn't bypass Ma Bell and the ill communication. Ever been to C53? Once. It's a real hole. Aliens find the Earth to be way less than acceptable cliche. Okay, if this call is urgent enough to use the sirens, why not take the cops and S.H.I.E.L.D. until after daybreak to respond? And why was S.H.I.E.L.D. alerted at all? It's a broken window at a f***ing blockbuster. Okay, this de-aging technology has officially gotten creepy as hell. I'll be honest, youngified Sam Jackson looks pretty awesome here, and I am terrified of how that technology will definitely be used in the future. This is the most convenient road near a train situation any city planner ever cooked up. Suspect on northbound train in pursuit. And she should be easy to track, considering she'll be the only person in Los Angeles to take the train. Sure, Stan Lee could have been reading Kevin Smith's Mallrats script in 1995. The movie came out October 20th, 1995, so this could be early in the year, when it was about to get shot or something. The problem is, the record story just left. Smashing Pumpkins, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, being advertised here as coming soon or already out, came out October 23rd, 1995. And while it's insane that those two things were only three days apart, Stan Lee would not have been reading this script in October unless he was just getting nostalgic about his cameo. <laughs> for the residents of LA to jump to an old lady's needs and all. But how is this even possible? You're telling me that after all the shit kicking Carol's done, three regular ass commuters could temporarily restrain her? Fight chase on top of a moving train? I feel like I've never seen that before, except always. Train's heading for a tunnel up ahead. Of course it is, tunnels. The only logical choice once you've opted for fight on top of a train. What? I'm still here at the Blockbuster. Colson saw Fury take off forever ago, so why is he just calling in? Also, look, I think the youngening effect they're using on Sam Jackson is amazing, but they must have used all the resources on that, because Clark Gregg's face makes Jeff Bridges and Tron Legacy look like fine art. <laughs> look, movie, no one in a major city subway terminal would look this hard and long at a girl in a weird costume. Subway terminals are f***ing beacons for folks in weird costumes. I rode a train once with Spider-Man and Marilyn Monroe, and a guy that looked exactly like Richard Grieco. Only I don't think that was a costume, I think that was just Richard Grieco. There you go. Now that no one can tell that's an alien, no one will ask questions about the body with a jacket thrown over its face inside the wrecked car. Ah, cool. The doohickey that the scroll dropped on the train gets inserted into the whatchamacallit and immediately displays plot-convenient footage, perfectly edited for maximum exposition. <laughs> Alta Vista, internet cafes, modems, big computer monitors. Wasn't 1995 hilarious? But seriously, how would Carol have the first goddamn clue how to work this? Theft. And sure, the motorcycle guy was an asshole and probably deserved it, but what did this vintage boutique ever do to anyone? Hey, how's your eye? I'd say fine. Phew, glad they're not gonna ham-handedly try and shoehorn a reason for Fury's eye patch into this movie. I got word on a motorcycle thief that fits her description. But instead of immediately following up on that lead, I'm gonna waste valuable time at S.H.I.E.L.D. espousing this clunky dialogue. Might even drink a cheer wine and stop by Sam Goody's to pick up a jagged little pill CD before I act on any of this information. Goggling.
Scrolls can only sim recent memories of their host bodies. That is literally the definition of a stupid restriction to put on an ability just for plot or hero reasons. Why should they even be able to access any memories if all they're doing is copycatting? Where were you born? Huntsville, Alabama. What good does this do, Carol? Except to provide a little more backstory for Fury. Is she able to verify this bullshit in any way? Prove you're not a scroll. Carol is a dick to what, if this is a jukebox from the 90s, has to be 30% ACDC CDs, 40% Tom Petty CDs, 29% Journey CDs, and 1% Van Morrison CD. Is that a communicator? Yeah. State-of-the-art two-way pager. Which would in no way work in a bunker like this, but I'm gonna keep making these nostalgic references as long as Marvel pays me to do so. How did this cat get into this official government covert facility? And did they know he was a flurkin? If so, why is he out roaming the f***ing halls? Hey, that's exactly how Eminem writes his lyrics. I'll assume Lawson was writing the follow-up to Stan. I want to question her alone. That sounds, well, evil and or dirty. All I know is we take him into dead or alive. Dead or alive? Yeah, agreed. That's excessive. It makes no sense. Unless your boss's boss is a scroll. <laughs> Holy f***. These are the loudest lights I've ever heard. Can you imagine the constant jump scares you'd have to endure if you were collating these records? This CGI cat is a f***ing abomination. And yes, the actress is allergic and they had to do a CGI cat in some places. But just take $20,000 of the money you're spending on youngifying Sam Jackson and put it into realisticing the cat. God damn. Also, they ran into that cat on level 5 in the storage room, and somehow it ran several floors away from that position, and got into the hangar, and onto a prototype aircraft that they would eventually use. Maria Rambo. So how do we get to Louisiana? I'm sorry, but the amount of information they've gleaned from a few seconds of glancing through the records, like Maria's exact address, is such bullshit that this movie is actively starting to stink. Why does Ronan look like a character from Mist here? Carol appeared almost lifelike on the hologram earlier, and even in full color. Is Accuser Tech still using dial-up or something? I see flashes little moments, but I can't tell what's real. I'll tell you what's real. Someone on this movie's set design team thinks this single mother living alone with her daughter keeps a bowl on the table with six f***ing lemons in it. That's real. That happened. Come look. You'd better come take a look at this cliche. That was all that survived the crash. Well, that's a lie. You're telling me a prototype aircraft crashed and every single piece of it disintegrated into dust, including the rest of this dog tag, but not this tiny corner of dog tag? You know, you really should be kind to your neighbors. You never know when you're gonna need to borrow some sugar. <laughs> This is pretty f***ing hilarious, but it's also ridiculous to think that the scrolls stopped off at a fast food joint to pick up some burgers and shakes on the way to Louisiana. And how would you know about the sugar borrowing habits of earthly suburbanites this soon into your stay on the planet? That was before I knew who you were. Before I knew what made you different from the others. Talos had to have gotten this information before the confrontation at the Pegasus base, since that's where he heard the recording. So if he knew that then, why did he try to kill Fury's ass? He knew they were working together, and now he's all peaceful. I actually really like this character's turn, but given the sequence of events, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What's happening? It's loading. F***ing Windows 95. Okay, so Jude Law shot Lawson before she could blow up the ship, but it takes like 15 seconds for him to show up at a distance in all this smoke. Plus, they're obstructed somewhat by the crashed ship, and they're on the downslope of a hill. How the f*** did he know where to aim? Carol got her powers by being fantastic forward by the warp engine, but the energy only hit her, despite Jan Rog standing about the same distance away. She absorbed his power. She's coming with us. Okay, I'd maybe buy that this recording spurred Carol's memory to recall the crash, but she's f***ing unconscious here, so how would she know this part? Quick question, why did they leave the main house and all go to the one day from collapse cabin to listen to the audio? It makes a nice shot, but it makes no sense from a human being standpoint. Is this house's only computer out in the decrepit barn? Why does Talos still have Keller's jacket on? We've seen that when they morph into other humans, they already have their clothes on, but now that he's turned back into his natural shape, the jacket should be gone, right? She wanted you to help us find the core. Then why the hell didn't she tell Carol about the reason for the mission in the first f***ing place? I know it would have been weird to come out as an alien, but they were already in top secret mode. This withholding of information bullshit makes about as much sense as what happened to Poe in The Last Jedi. Do you hear me? Man, this depiction of the friendship between two strong, independent women that is emotional but not corny is long overdue. And it's about goddamn time that Marvel showed it. So I'm gonna take a sin off because I'm totally a social justice warrior or virtue signaler or whatever the latest term that's complimentary but is being used to be derogatory. Take it off! This moonlight shot makes no sense. The pole at the bottom right of the shot shows a shadow that matches up with the moon's location. But then the spaceship thing that Veers flew here has a shadow that suggests another, even stronger light source off screen to the right. When they were handing out kids, they gave her the toughest one. Lieutenant Trouble. You remember. 
So, is everything cool now? Like, can Carol remember everything about her life on Earth? That black box recording was f***ing magic. What purpose does this function of the spacesuit serve? Like, some Kree was almost finished designing it, and the Supreme Intelligence poked its head in and was like, don't forget to add the unnecessary color wheel. Why did they bring the f***ing cat to space? This cat will later freak out on Fury and cut his face, but he doesn't want to do it here, in zero gravity, which is baffling, because I've owned a cat before. A lawnmower can freak them out. A clap of thunder can freak them out. Suspending in zero gravity? That would have them clawing out the eyeballs of all the mother nearby until they were on solid footing. The cloaking activated. Holy balls, is there anything this magical wrist doohickey can't do? Can it order takeout, purchase ebooks, access free porn? Ah, who am I kidding? Of course it can access free porn. In her notes, she called it the Tesseract. You know, I'm fine with the timeline of the Tesseract. The idea that Howard Stark helped found Pegasus in the 80s and handed it over to this project is totally okay. I'm just tired of the f***ing Tesseract. It shows up in seemingly every movie, being all Tesseracty and stuff. She's a pinball wizard. It's gotta be a twist. A pinball wizard has got such a supple wrist. Evil dude picked up the cat, carried it all the way here, and just tosses it casually. And that is a ton of wasted effort. What did you do to your uniform? They got in her head. Just like we thought. When? Carol's been calling with updates constantly since she's been on Earth. And there's no way they would know that the scrolls have flipped her. This jacket... It's killer, by the way. Does the Supreme Intelligence seriously have the bandwidth and the inclination for pithy one-liners? Species. Lurking. Threat. High. So I'll calmly place a cat-sized muzzle over its mouth that I just happen to be carrying on my person. Without us, you're only human. A flesh and blood you made. You're only human. Born to make mistakes. This montage of various carols getting up after falling down is excessive and on the nose and over the top. On Hala, you were reborn. Veers. Because every sci-fi movie apparently needs an alien race to misread something and call it something else. Like Star Trek with Beejer and Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes with Kalima. This goes on for some time. I will say this about the movie. It waits until the perfect time to unveil Carol's true powers. And this is a goosebumps inducing moment. So it absolutely deserves a sin-off. Having said that, this reveal sets up the same issue as DC has with Superman. Carol is all powerful. She hasn't discovered everything she can do yet, but she's pretty much unkillable now. And future movies, <coughs> Endgame, <coughs> will have to do a ton of hand waving and marginalization for her to be included at all into the rest of the MCU. Okay, look, playing I'm just a girl during the climactic scene of this movie, that's more on the nose than anything ever. Literally, the only more on the nose song you could have chosen is Meredith Brooks' Bitch, or maybe Barbie Girl, or Cindy Lauper's... Well, the movie never explains it, or even suggests it, but Jan Rog apparently has the ability to manipulate metal like Magneto. And that needs more backstory than anything in this movie that you actually gave a backstory for. God damn. <laughs> How the f*** did that happen? The movie is directly contradicting its own previous implications about the power differential here. Oh, they're dogfighting in the canyons, just like an in independence. Sky Captain in the world of two Marvel. Dude, Carol may be all powerful, but does she also have a GPS built into her headpiece? How the hell did she know exactly where Yon Rog ended up? She didn't even see him crash. Prove to me! You can beat me with that! This is a great moment, but it was also super f***ing obvious that it was going to go down like this. This is basically Indy taking out the sword guy with the gun in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, mother flurkin! Mother flurkin. I'll be back before you know it. She will not. For emergencies only, okay? And real emergencies, too. Not like if an alien species is invading one of your most populous cities and your shadow government is about to nuke the out of it as a result. And really it would take a giant stroke of some luck and some space gravity to avoid total annihilation, but you can totally handle that. You think you can find others like her? Mm -hmm. We found her and we weren't even looking. Okay, the logic here is stunning. And yes, they do end up finding more heroes, but it's not because they already existed. Carol was a one in a billion fluke. Banner still hasn't tested gamma radiation yet. Tony has to be kidnapped and build a suit in a cave. Black Widow is just a human badass and Hawkeye is decent to okay with arrows. Just how amazing would this cat vomit scene be if we didn't know where the Tesseract went during the sequence on Lawson's Lab? It might have felt worth sitting through the 12 minutes of credits. Might have. Lala. Hawkeye's entire goddamn family gets snapped away. His wife and three children. In Ant-Man 2, more ant-ning, we saw Scott lose everyone around him when he went into the quantum realm. We saw both Fury and Maria Hill disappear, and meanwhile, Craig and his family are completely okay. You hear that, Craig? you and your stupid family, Craig. 34 seconds like the Marvel logos. Holy shit. Thank God it finally showed up. I thought I was going to pass out. I feel like Ethan Hunt getting a hit of oxygen after that free dive in Rogue Nation. So the fuel cells were cracked during battle and we figured out a way to reverse the ion charge and bought ourselves about 48 hours of flight time. Why the f*** 
did they take off in this ship without inspecting every last detail? I know the urge to go home is strong, but they could have stayed on Titan for a while to potentially find supplies, fix whatever needed to be fixed, and find fuel from at least two ships that crash landed during that fight, Nebula's Necrocraft and the Q ship. I feel like this whole thing was made up just to get Captain Marvel involved. Wait, each of these sinks in this bathroom have individual shaving mirrors? Is that really necessary? Seems like the Avengers could divert their interior design budget to like, I don't know, alien missile defense, which would come in very handy later in the movie. Gwyneth Paltrow doesn't know what movie she's in in this scene. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. Thanos wiped out 50% of all living creatures. Even though the world governments are in pieces, they were able to take not only an impromptu census, but also a cat and dog census. And who cares if it was 50% or not? If you wiped out 10%, the situation is still f Honestly, into this exact second, I thought you were Build-A-Bear. Har har tones. This falls just as flat as what he called Ebony Maw Squidward in Infinity War. Rando pop culture references don't always equate to comedy, movie. We're the Avengers, not the Pre-Avengers. Okay. Right? You made your point. Just sit down, okay? okay? No, no, here's my point. You know what? She's sit, great. Sit down. Way. Pick a lane, movie. Either Tony is so upset that he can't think straight, or he's just lighthearted enough to make whimsical comments about Captain Marvel and call Rocket a Build-A-Bear. It can't be both. I can tell you what Thanos is. Where has she been this whole time? Did they not allow her in the meeting? Jeez, so much of that previous scene could have been totally avoided. To the garden. That's cute. Thanos has a retirement plan. Do the Avengers have a quota of snarky wisecracks that have to be inserted within certain intervals? That's annoying. I'm built on snarky movie wisecracks and I don't even have a quota. Until two days ago on this planet. Wait, did you figure this out because Nebula said she knew where Thanos was? Or did you just run a diagnostic on power surges? Why didn't you do that before? All Nebula knew was the garden, so that didn't help you with your power surge report. And where the hell have you been all this time? There are a lot of other planets in the universe. And unfortunately, they didn't have you guys. How did the story of Thanos looking for the Infinity Stones elude you in your travels? This is gonna work, Steve. I know it will, because I don't know what I'm gonna do if it doesn't. Go back to the Fantastic Four? After that, the stones serve no purpose beyond temptation. You murder truly! Has anyone in this universe learned not to shove somebody who's being held in place for a good goddamn reason? Why did Captain Marvel even let go of Thanos anyway? Doesn't matter in the end, but Jesus! I used the stones to destroy the stones. Weird. I used my farts to cover for other farts, but there were still farts left over, so what gives? Lizzie Thornton! Movie gives us the actual time it takes for this text to show up on screen. So, nearly four billion people are left on the planet and nobody's good enough to play baseball? Or is this more of a comment on the Mets' attendance? And that's it. That's those little brave baby steps we gotta take. Good for Cap getting involved in group therapy, but what is this group? Is he the leader? Did he form it? Did he print out all those flyers, or did he do a Facebook post? Is there free coffee? Is there still Facebook? Are they in the city? God damn it, this group is never mentioned again, and I'm furiously curious about it. I think the thing that's most infuriating about this rat is that a simple press of a button gets Scott back. At the end of Ant-Man 2, Die Antwoord, the Pims had initiated a return sequence that they were unable to finish because they were snapped away. But this button turns everything back on as if computers just bookmark they were doing five years ago. I guess it's possible possible a good number of waste management employees were dusted, causing trash to pile up temporarily? But it's been five years, and that's five years of the population creating only half the trash that they'd previously produced. So why is it built up on the streets like this is the road or some sh**? This list of vanished people has an order I'd describe as pseudo-alphabetical. It's got a lot of names that start with L-A-B, but a few L-A-M and L-A-Z and L-A-N mixed in. Whoever did this memorial is a wonderful person, but a dick to efficiency. Scott is looking at this stone with these names here, and this will eventually be the one where he sees his own name at eye level. But Scott Lang is nowhere in the middle of this tablet until the movie cuts, and neither are the other people. Once again, tele-holograms will have a normal conversation with each other like they're literally standing in a room like this, when in fact they're all by themselves, in some sort of hollow booth that I would just once like to see in operation. If they're wearing VR, we'd see it on their holograms. If they have a panoramic video screen around them that is tied to a certain channel, then where is camera? I'm sorry, that must have been a very long five years. Yeah, but that's just it. It wasn't. For me, it was five hours. Directors accidentally filmed Paul Rudd talking about his real life and put it in the movie. Also, if the quantum realm makes years seem like hours, why did Michelle Pfeiffer look 30 years older when she got rescued from it? And if there was a relative time difference, why were Hank and Scott able to talk over a radio in real time at the end of Ant-Man 2, Antebellum Parabellum? What if there was a, a way that we could enter the quantum realm at a certain point in time, but then exit the quantum realm at another point in time? So you spent five hours in the quantum realm because of relativity. That was five years on Earth. The problem is, in both the quantum realm and in the outside world, time was moving forward. So why do you think there are points that you can go to just because of your five-hour experience with relativity? So who do we talk to about this? How about a f 
a quantum physicist. Look, I know Tony is brilliant, but this has never been his forte. If anything, Scott himself should know more about appropriate sciences through his associations with Hank. Why not see if Larry Fishburne is still alive? We could go back, we could get them. Sure, getting your friends and loved ones back is a noble idea, but it's also morally murky. Remember, life has been going on for five years now. People have moved on. People are in new marriages. Some dangerous people who used to torment others are out of the picture. This would cause even more chaos and be like Castaway times 3.5 billion. Model rendered. Holy Tony solves the eternal question of time travel in less time than it took to actually write the scene. Why the f does Pepper need five lamps and one lit candle to read a book about composting? Trying to get you to stop has been one of the few failures of my entire life. Pithy one-liner aside, the f he totally stopped. He's out here raising a family in a goddamn cabin in the woods, washing his own dishes and tucking his kid into bed at night. He's not out there Iron Manning anymore, so this line is a big old sack of Okay, here we go. Time travel test number one. This test is not successful, but it's also not unsuccessful in that they do actually transport Scott over time. So this means that two scientists have made giant breakthroughs in time travel over the same roughly 12 hour period. A fully functioning time space GPS. It's weird to me that Tony knew enough of Hank Pym's work to properly make a device that would help people travel through time in the quantum realm, a place where only two people have ever been, with one of those people evaporated by the snap and the other being a lovable doofus Scott. I thought the first Ant-Man was about how Hank took his work and hid it from everyone, including Tony's dad. And the evil Darren Cross tried to make his own tech that ended up liquefying a baby lamb. And they ended up blowing up dude's lap. I'm pretty sure they didn't give this tech to Tony. So the result is Tony's a genius don't think time travel possible. By rule, I think the movie has to do this because the how isn't all that explainable, and the movie is three hours, but Jesus. It took Doc Brown 30 years to perfect time travel, and it didn't even require that much explanation because you trusted the amount of time that went into it. This is 100% on Scott here. How did he not notice a motherfucking spaceship about to land a few yards away before he opened the taco? He won't see you. Huh. Seems a little weird to reduce a badass character like Valkyrie into a glorified gatekeeper with little agency otherwise. I'm sure this gets rectified later in the movie, though. Let's see. Scrolling, scrolling looking. Oh yeah, she takes out one of those Chitari whale things and gets a half-assed offer to run Asgard now that it's a fishing village. And not the landmark for civilization known across the universe. Thor! Thor's fat. Get it? It's a joke. For almost the whole movie. Except when the movie wants you to take it seriously. Then back to joke. Get it? Of all the bullshit this movie did not need, it's Hawkeye's career as a vigilante. But even more, I can't believe Hawkeye is the kind of guy who can take on a horde of Yakuza on his own. You might say Hawkeye has fought tons of enemies stronger than this, and I say with help. One side there, Lebowski. Hilarious reference, but this is a reference to a movie that starred Jeff Bridges, who was in the original Iron Man. Stop with the constant references, especially when they make no goddamn sense. Gah! Changing the past doesn't change the future. You see, we needed a way to do time travel where we didn't f*** up the present. So now we're doing the kind of time travel where we create alternate timelines. I'm sure it won't be just as confusing as all the other time travel movies, and there will be no debate about this at all by the time it's over. Think about it. If you travel to the past, that past becomes your future and your former present becomes the past, which can't now be changed by your new future. Are we really just going to leave out the alternative timeline explanation here? Because this reason focuses on the effects of time travel on one individual. It basically says all those new timeline people can go f themselves. So back to the future is a bunch of bullshit. I'll have you know Alan Silvestri scored that movie and this one, so you owe an apology to Alan Silvestri and the entire goddamn world who loves that movie. We only have enough pin particles for one round trip each. And these stones have been in a lot of different places. They later accidentally themselves into Hank's lab in 1970 and grab some Pym juice then. But why wouldn't they just start by going back to a time when Hank was alive and grab a bunch of them then? So that they'd have almost unlimited chances at this. I'm not just throwing out a crazy amateur theory. This makes all the sense. And there are at least two super geniuses on this team. She stuck her hand inside a rock this one time. And, and then the ether stuck itself inside her. As cringy and silly as this description is, still beats watching the entirety of Thor The Dark World. It's almost like you guys were blocked perfectly to get this one shot. I'm sure it was a fluke and it definitely won't happen again to like all your female characters in a lame attempt to get a girl power splash page later in the movie. I like the Avengers theme a lot. Like, it's one of the most recognizable themes in modern movies. But they lean hard into that in this movie. This would be like Star Wars playing the opening fanfare during all your favorite moments in Return of the Jedi. Movie gives me another chance to send this stupid gun cocking that Black Widow does during the hero shot. Hordes of aliens are raining down on New York, but sure, the fate of the world might end up resting on that Glock. Oh, thanks for the rooftop assist, Ancient One. You ever think of maybe sending some of the masters, you know, out to the battle, since this directly threatens Earth? Does the threat only have to be mystical before you get off your ass? We just... 
Wait around for this Quill guy to show up. Why would the Nebula footage start right here, at the most expositional part of Rhodey's dialogue? Why didn't it start, like, when she was peeing? Not that I want to see that or anything, I'm just saying that would happen more frequently than- Damn it, you perverts, let's just move on. As far as I'm concerned, that's America's ass. This ass play, I mean wordplay, is funny. Really funny, actually. And even though this movie is overly quippy, I gotta give this one a send back. Maximum occupancy has been reached. And this tiny detail directly leads to the cluster- that takes Tony and Cap back to the 70s. It's like the butterfly effect, only hulkier. I'm gonna have to call the director. That's okay. Trust me. Hail Hydra. Look, this is a great scene. It's even a fun throwback to Winter Soldier in the middle of the 2012 Avengers timeline. But this asshole decides, eh, we don't have to call the director about this. Even though he's never been told that Cap is on board with Hydra. I mean, he doesn't even think it might be a trick or some <laughs> So many stairs! I know, and what's really up is how you could just jump down that open part in the middle and not have to mess with them at all. And I'm gonna need that case. Movie makes it seem like ownership of the Tesseract was hotly contested right after the battle in New York. And I'm sorry, if you listen to Nick Fury talking to Shadowy Powers Booth at the end of The Avengers, it sounded like it was up to Fury whether Thor took the Tesseract back, not Alexander Pierce. And Fury thought it was a good thing Thor was taking it away. Also, this is all happening like minutes after the Council decided to nuke Manhattan in the original Avengers, mind you. But the Secretary himself is here in no time? Was he seriously not outside the blast radius when they gave the order? This supposedly secure top secret government case opens in midair after Hulk crashes through the door. Yes, Hulk is strong, but the case was not touched by the door or Hulk as he came crashing through. If the sheer whiplash of this violence opened the case, then Tony should be dead. This scene brought to you by a future TV series on Disney+. Plus. The Infinity Stones create what you experience as the flow of time. Remove one of the stones, and that flow splits. Oh, is that so? So, in 2023 present day, with the stones destroyed, what did that do with the flow of time? Or do the atoms still count? In this new branch reality, without our chief weapon against the forces of darkness, our world would be overrun. The branch reality discussion confuses this movie a little bit, because according to the rules of time travel in this film, this reality is already different from the main timeline. For instance, in this reality, Loki has the Tesseract after the Battle of New York. So it seems like the main issue isn't so much branch realities, but the fact that this timeline wouldn't have a time stone anymore. I can't risk this reality on a promise. I'll also require a hunch about what Doctor Strange is going to do in a few years. I have that. Reality risked. There's another consciousness sharing her network. Wait, Nebula is on a network? So you're saying that when Thanos was systematically replacing Nebula's human parts with machine parts, he decided to include a f***ing modem? Where is this other Nebula? In our solar system. Of course she is, but does it matter anyway? Considering the portals and jumps and Bifrost and Captain Marvel assists and all that bull Seems like pretty much anyone can get from one end of the universe to the other lickety split. I am totally from the future. Yes, you are. I really need to talk to you. It is awesome in a multi-layered way how the time travel gambit not only allows for this movie to correct a wrong, but to also allow some key characters to see their loved ones once more in a completely natural and unplanned way. It's an unexpected bonus, and it deserves a sin off. Natalie Portman's in this movie so briefly that I'm convinced the director's broke into her apartment and just took footage of her waking up in the morning without telling her. Thor totally f the Dark World's Thor. There's a battle about to take place here. And you screwed him because you want your hammer back? Sure, Steve brings the hammer back, but Thor doesn't know that someone's going to make a return trip until later when Bruce finds out about the branch realities from the Ancient One. Oh, f*** you. Thanos and Maul have been f***ing around with 2014 Nebula a bunch already. And this is the time you start to glitch. I am inevitable. Damn, Nebula's got some sick editing software in her memory banks, considering she was all the way over here. But the camera's fixed on Thanos' left side. You're repeating Nothing. yourself, you know that? You're repeating yourself. You're repeating yourself. I want to believe that this movie, which has literally been replaying scenes from that movie with the same characters, has some sense of this ironic dialogue. But my sin hardened heart won't let it happen. What are we improvising? Scott, get this back to the compound. Shoot up. What's in New Jersey? Okay, there's no rush to do this. There's no reason not to tell Scott where they're going and why, other than to be dicks. Guys, I've got it. Since we lost the wonderful Stan Lee, let's just cast Mark Maron to stand in for his cameos in future MCU movies. Look at him, it's perfect. You new here? Not exactly. Oh no, this is a real problem for our heroes. This lady's gonna alert the authorities and it's gonna be a huge impediment to them getting back to the future. Look, I know Marvel has an excellent track record with their de-aging tech, but this job on Michael Douglas is straight out of Tron Legacy. Tony's going to fit this Tesseract in this briefcase? I don't think so. Let's just say that the uh, greater good has rarely outweighed my own self-interest. This whole sequence is emotional. Very emotional indeed. But Howard spilling his guts to an ostensible stranger, along with Cap accidentally into the office adjacent to Peggy, feels so forcibly contrived it might as well be from a standard-ass rom-com. But 
That doesn't mean you're useless. 2014 Nebula goes through the trouble of removing 2023 Nebula's orange headpiece to fool the other Avengers when she takes her place. But she's not going to bother replicating the burned metal Terminator hand that 2023 Nebula has after grabbing the Power Stone. Christian Bale from The Prestige would not be impressed. But the raccoon didn't have to climb a mountain. But how do they know to climb this mountain? Or any mountain at all? There's an entire planet to explore, but they're positive the f***ing Soul Stone is right here? Natasha. Daughter of Ivan. Clint. Son of Edith. F*** your other parents, they don't matter. In order to take the stone, you must lose that which you love. Whew, good thing they just happened to send these two bosom buddies up here, and not like Rhodey and Scott. Tell my family I love them. <laughs> you tell them yourself. Sacrificing. This being the second time we've seen a successful acquisition of the Soul Stone, I'm wondering, what the f*** does Red Skull do after this? Does he wait until someone brings it back? And remember, Steve is supposed to come back here later and replace the stone like this never happened. Where does he put it? The fact that this stone is acquired by a sacrifice rather than stolen makes it a problematic stone to return, no? Can't be undone. Well, yeah, it can actually. Since you guys obviously don't give a f about other timelines, you can just go back to a time where she's lived and just take her with you. Since you can't change the past, you could just go back to before you did this and take her from there. The other timelines can go f themselves. They hate you because they ain't you. Do you. What do you think is coursing through my veins right now? She's whiz. This is an emotional scene. Natasha is dead. They're about to bring back their loved ones. Thor, who's been racked with guilt and is depressed over his failure to kill Thanos, is pleading seriously with his team to do the unsnap. And Cheese Whiz somehow enters this script right now. I can remember everyone Thanos snapped away five years ago. We're just bringing them back to now, today. Don't change anything from the last five years. This sounds like a thought that's so complex that nobody could possibly do it right. How do they even know how this snap works? Hooray! Hulk snap brought back all the dead folks to life. But let's think about the practicalities here. What happened to people who were like on a flight when Thanos did his Do they appear in midair and do a wily e. Coyote shrug before falling to their deaths? Or did Hulk guide them to safety? And how unfair is it that the people who were snapped away off an airplane get to live, but the people who crashed into the airplane just stay dead? And if the people who died were brought back, then check the cemeteries because we have a zombie apocalypse on our hands. With the stones you've collected for me, create a new one, teeming with life, that knows not what it has lost, but only what it has been given. So with the stones, he could have literally done anything he wanted, and he chose option Z cut the population of the universe in half. What a f***ing dick! I was on board with Thanos' thoughtful madness because it made a certain sense for a villain to exercise a cruel intelligence on life in his quest for balance. But now that we know he could create a whole universe, that whole balance thing that he once espoused and I believed in no longer works. He could have created two Earths connected by an accordion tunnel and told astrophysics to go f*** itself while half the population moved to the literal new world. Source material doesn't matter in the CinemaSins universe, but the word on the street is that the comic book Thanos did all this to impress a lady named Death. That's right, the power of boners made Thanos do this, and his actions make way more sense under that context than this does. Iron Man has a clear headshot, and his coldly calculating billion dollar suit misses like a dick. Okay, fine movie. Have a sin back. Wait, why is the whole army showing up here? And now? They know there are only a few of them left, right? So what are they advancing on? Hell, I can't even see that Thanos has essentially won. On your left. This is the moment that got me. You can have your Avengers assemble and your cap hammer beats, and they're great, but nothing brings the goosebumps like this subtle, humble callback that indicates the mother cavalry's coming. This is the entire movie, right here. Five sins off. Having said that, this is what you've earned after being subjected to two and a half hours of fuzzy time logic, overdramatic talky talk, ham-handed quips, and way too many side stories, presumably intended to set up multiple properties that can live on Disney+. Plus. This is like sitting through a concert where Hanson plays their entire sh back catalog, but finally pays it off by playing Mbop as the first encore. I would love to be in the planning meeting with Doctor Strange where he's arranging these entrances like he's the stage manager of a Broadway show. Okay, T'Challa, you're up, baby! Energy! Play to the back row. Now, where's Falcon? Pepper, I'm glad you're here, but you look kind of fake in that suit. Is that everyone? What, you wanted more? That's hilarious, but the question was, is that everyone? Not, is this the best you could do? And honestly, yes, I'd want as many as I can get. Avengers! Assemble. Yes! Although, this means we're gonna get a stupid jumble of effects-driven bullshit fan service for the next several minutes before there are actual stakes involved, aren't we? You will not believe what's been going on! There's probably a better time to explain everything later because we're in the middle of a goddamn battle, but I wanted to make sure you didn't feel guilty about me dying anymore before you yourself die. Cap! What do you want me to do with this damn thing? Get those stones as far away as possible! No! 
We need to get them back where they came from. This might be the dumbest part of the movie, because Cap and Hulk's orders are not mutually exclusive. They should be getting the stones as far away as possible so that the Thanos can't get them. And they can always take the stones back after they beat Thanos anytime they want to solve the branch reality problem. Anyone see an ugly brown van out there? Yes, but you're not gonna like where it's parked. Really, Valkyrie? You can see the ugly brown van in the middle of this dark wasteland called New Jersey? Also, I understand the Avengers have little calm things constantly in their ears, but how the sh is Valkyrie on this frequency? And if all of them have that sh how can they hear any one person talking? If I tell you what happens, it won't happen. This is absolutely telling him what happens. As I see Ant-Man and the Wasp smiling at each other and shrinking down, I'm once again compelled to ask why they can't fly into Thanos' ear canal or nostril, re themselves, and explode Thanos into a hundred million balanced chunks of meat. It's dead. Well, is there a spare rat around you could use to fire that up? I don't know how you're gonna get it through all of that. Really? Did you not see her pile drive a giant spaceship a minute ago? The real question is, I don't know how all that is gonna get through her. She's got help. The sentiment comes from a good place, but this shot is patronizing in so many ways. It's like after years of not creating action figures for their characters and not making solo female-driven stories, here's our acknowledgement of their importance. And as if all the women would suddenly show up all at once with no men. Kind of insulting. Come on, of all the scenes in the Marvel movies that don't make the power differential clear between two opponents, it's this one. Captain Marvel is world stronger than Thanos. Thanos has taken a beating so far. <clears throat> See what I mean? Now he's got the glove with the stones and Marvel is doing some shield thing and somehow he is getting owned in this battle now and I don't know what to think anymore. During the struggle, Iron Man is able to remove the stones from the nanotech gauntlet. Either there was an ejector button or he pried them off. I don't know what the hell happened. It looks like the stones may have fallen off and landed on the ground. But that could just be pieces of Tony's suit for all I know. But somehow, this turns into Tony having possession of the stones, no questions asked. Do they have to turn to dust if you kill a bunch of fools with the Infinity Gauntlet? Like, can you ask them to turn into something a little jazzier? Like confetti? Or Dippin' Dots? Or play slime? Or something, I don't know, less dour? I guess Tony ordered up to make all the Thanos army disappear in front of Thanos before Thanos disappears snap. If you're the Avengers, don't you get a little worried that Thanos isn't going away during all this? <laughs> Whoa! How did they know to call Insidious out here? Random kid Tony ran into in Iron Man 3 got an invite to the funeral? You know, I wish there was a way that I could let her know. The Lord of the Rings, Return of the King was like, no one would dare do as many endings as our shit. We tested the fuck out of our audience's patience. And then Avengers Endgame came along and was like, hold my pen particle. Remember, you have to return the stones to the exact moment you got them. You're gonna open up a bunch of nasty alternative realities. Which is totally impossible. How does he inject the ether back into Jane and Thor the Dark World, since it's in stone form now? Or does he even have to? Can he just lay it on her end table? The Soul Stone's return is totally ridiculous. Does he find the pool we've seen Hawkeye and Thanos bathing in? Or does he go up to the mountain and hope Red Skull is there? And what kind of reunion would that be? When he goes back to these realities, is he coming the split second they're taken? Or does he have to interact with the Avengers trying to steal them? And if the people who stole the stones aren't there, then... How did the stones disappear in the first place? Also, this is beginning to sound like you could change the past if you wanted. This movie is propped up on creating alternate timelines when you go back to the past, so how can you revisit existing timelines if that's the rule? Doesn't the quantum tunnel bar you from going back to your own timeline? And returning in five, four... Why are they trying to bring him back? Isn't the important thing that they just keep the quantum tunnel open? Because as was shown in the 2012 to 1970 jump, they don't even need this platform when they travel through time. I guess old Steve's a mystery, right? Like, did he transport here when they weren't looking? Remember, this whole time he's been living in an alternate reality where he marries Peggy, so he had to transport to get here. Or did he transport to and hide in the woods, knowing this was the day they were sending him back to replace the stones and snuck over to the bench for a big surprise? Yeah, I'd say they stuck the landing on this. That's a good ending. I'm not made of stone. At this point, I bet Audi has paid for 10% of the entire MCU budget with their oppressive product placement in these movies. What are we, fighting the weather now? Locals say the cyclone had a face. Oh, people see things when they're under stress. Like a giant green hulk, or a Norse god who wields a hammer, or a woman in black spandex wielding a glock. I'm just saying, with the superheroes and villains that exist, is a weather monster that far out of the box? You just need to chill, Hill. 36 seconds of Marvel logo, a minute and 47 seconds into the movie, and after we had to sit through 32 seconds of Sony getting the upper hand logos at the beginning of the movie. Gone, but not forgotten. This year has been nothing short of... It is crazy. It's like insane. Why is the school news station doing an in-memoriam about the dead Avengers at the end of an entire school year? Wouldn't this have been something they broadcast on the first day of school? Closer to the actual deaths? Over five years ago, half of all life in the universe- Again, why is this being discussed on the last day of school? Nearly a year after the unsnap? Wouldn't high school students of all people have gotten beyond that early in the school year and this last day newscast would be about college and valedictorian and, you know, regular high school 
It makes for a good expositional dump, but it makes no sense in context. Eight months ago, a band of brave heroes brought us back. <laughs> Still calling bullshit on no one appearing in the exact same space as another human being causing some weird mutation strength. But at least the movie chose to show the gym scene in this scenario, as opposed to what happened in the men's room. They called it the blip. Comic Sans. Also, this movie basically ignores the blip, except for this one 60 second news broadcast, which is probably because the filmmakers weren't told the details of Endgame, but ends up feeling like they didn't care about the events of Endgame. I'm gonna buy her a black dahlia necklace because her favorite flower is the black dahlia because of, well, the murder. The murder. MJ is f***ed up. Date her at your own risk, dude. I see this ending badly if she's picking favorite flowers based on her favorite murder, or even has a favorite murder. I may not know much, but I do know this. Europeans love Americans. Um, you might want to check that, Ned. According to the published and certified Love Actually documentation, it's Americans who love Europeans. By the way, travel tip, you should probably download a VPN on your phone just so that the government can't track you while we're abroad. Conspiracy theorists. When I blipped back to my apartment, the family that was living there was very confused. I'm sure. And just imagine all the people that blipped back in the middle of the ocean because they were on a boat or landed on the third rail and died because they had been in a subway car. And you know there were some people mid-orgasm. How did that work out for them? Jesus, I think I want a series of movies on various people that blipped back. Maybe not the orgasm people. Can't be said enough, I hate, hate, hate Spider-Man wearing an iron suit. Yes, it does happen in the comics, you nerds, but it's relatively brief. And this is the second movie he's worn this suit in. And it's just not Spider-Man when he's in an iron armor. That mask CGIing off his head looks insanely stupid. I just want him to pull his mask off. Is that asking too much? You sent Nick Fury to voicemail? Yeah. You don't send Nick Fury to voicemail. Did you hear that? I send everyone to voicemail. Brad Bird could call me and tell me Disney picked up the rights to my books and he wants to direct them. And he would still be saying all that to my voicemail box. Part of it is that I'm half deaf and I don't hear well. And my phone transcribes voicemails to me almost instantly. The other part is that I get so many f***ing calls from scammers, asshats, salesmen, and family members that I am mathematically better off not answering any calls. And math ain't never done lied to me once. Hungry? <gasps> I thought that you could sense that with your... Peter Tingle. Hey, we forgot to mention Spidey Sense in the first movie, so we'll just have a banana in the face gag here, so you don't think we're complete idiots. How would he be able to pack that, even if he wanted to? I'm assuming that giant charging port would have to come with it. Good luck explaining that at the airport before boarding an international flight. This looks like a regular airplane, but look closer, and you will see that absolutely no one in coach is wishing they were dead right now. Flash makes fun of Peter about being on an airplane, but also Flash is in first class. And yeah, he's rich, but what kind of a school trip lets individual rich students upgrade to first class on their own? He blipped, so technically Technically, he's 16, not 21. And isn't that what his ID would say? They most certainly would have checked before serving him. Heart of Iron. Heart of Iron. They made a Tony Stark documentary and they chose the title Heart of Iron. Why not Stark Realities? Or why not the MCU? Or Dead Dickhead Now Revered? Or Tony, Tony, Tony? Someone falls asleep on a trip and puts their head on the lap or shoulder of another character and it's awkward cliche. We have a lot in common. So uh, we're boyfriend and girlfriend now. That was fast. I know that's the joke, but still. An eight-hour flight feels more like an excuse to get Peter alone for more of this film, and as such, it works. Whatever happened to being an American bachelor in Europe? Peter, those were the words of a boy. And that boy met a woman. Ned is a little too Manny Delgado in this movie for my taste. There's nothing in there. I swear. Yeah, that usually works with customs agents. Also, why wouldn't Aunt May shove that suit under some clothes or something? She knows this is a secret identity, so her disregard for secrecy here makes no sense. Are you telling me that in eight months since the unblippening, airports and public buildings worldwide have all unanimously decided to deify Tony Stark in massive artwork displays? Do you have any idea how long it takes a government to make a decision? Eight months? Can a master painter even finish a portrait this size in that amount of time? Couple bags off, we're gonna meet at the Da Vinci Museum at three! The f you have two adults on this student trip and you're not going with them to the museum? You're letting them find their own way? In Venice? Without an adult? What am I watching? What is this? Martin Starr is a great comic actor, but physical comedy isn't necessarily for everyone. He had a good couple moments in Homecoming, and now this movie is tripling down on that teacher you laughed at last time. So we get him falling asleep on Peter, telling marriage sob stories to Peter, and now aping Mr. Bean. Bo, it's the most perfect word in the world. Italians created it and I just discovered it. What does it mean? That's the thing, it can mean a million things. Not sure how that's cool or helpful. How would anyone know which version of the word bow you're using? Smurfing Italians. Also, this bow never comes back again or is referred to throughout the rest of the movie. It's literally just filling and killing time with a word that means nothing. Bow is my new superpower. It's like the anti-aloha. I'm pretty sure the movie Aloha was the anti-aloha. I guess you could suspend my disbelief enough to believe that Mysterio would have his theatrics staged in Venice when Peter is there because, well, Peter is there. Except I don't know how he would know at this point that Peter is also Spider-Man. But regardless, I'm calling bullshit that he would know Peter would be at this exact place at the time he did this, so the whole scenario is built on an Italian river of lies! In all seriousness, what did you think that was going to accomplish? Does Peter often swing on his web by connecting them to the Hudson River? <laughs>
I know people are running for their lives, but you're telling me no one sees this? It's broad daylight, man. And there are so many no one sees this moments later in this movie, I'm giving it five sins right here and now to cover them all. What do you mean it's close to when? November. You didn't check the website? Oh, that's a good idea. Too much teacher! <laughs> Screwball prop comedy in a f***ing Spider-Man movie? There's comedy, and then there's emo Peter dancing to staying alive, and while you're not in that territory, you're closer than I would like you to be. Who is that guy? I don't know, but he's kicking that water's ass. Pretty intense scene and all. Too bad we've already seen two much better versions of this scene with the train scene in Spider-Man 2 and the boat scene in Spider-Man Homecoming. And two much better movies, I could add, and I think I will. BuzzFeed says there's a sailor named Morris Bench who was exposed to an experimental underwater generator and got hydro powers. Movie uses a likeness to a character from the comics called Hydro Man, but it isn't actually Hydro Man. However, movie has Flash talk about the origins of Morris Bench, AKA Hydro Man from the comics anyways. You just shot Ned. Just a mild tranquilizer, he'll be all right. Sure, but what if he'd fallen on the side of his neck with the trank dart? Wouldn't it have then shoved the whole thing further into his neck and caused medical problems and I tried to bring you here, you avoided me, and now you're here. What a coincidence. Wait, was this a coincidence? This movie doesn't even know its coincidences from its contrivances. Another person touches that door, you and I are going to attend another funeral. How does Peter have any control over that? There are multiple realities, Peter. This is Earth, Dimension 616. I'm from Earth 833. Because Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse exists, the viewer accepts the idea of multiple universes. But in this world, the multiverse hasn't been explored yet. And it seems like Nick Fury would be on to Mysterio from the beginning. Or simply call Doctor Strange and ask if this is legit. Because this story is suspicious as hell. Don't ever apologize for being the smartest one in the room. The Zuckerberg family motto. I mean, I'm just a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, sir. Bitch, please, you've been to space. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm only human. Captain Marvel. Don't invoke her name. Why not? And for something like this that could destroy the f***ing world, why wouldn't you use Captain Marvel? She's stronger than everyone and everything. You should have heard me on the phone with him. I really gave him hell. All I heard was crying. <sighs> The name of this road in English translates to Nobody Nope Road. The French call it Les No. Peter waited so long to put on these Stark glasses that I actually had forgotten all about them. Why would a high school kid like Peter wait so long to see what a now dead Tony Stark left for? I'm shocked he didn't put them on as soon as they were handed to him, come to think of it. I have access to the entire Stark global security network, including multiple defense satellites, as well as back doors to all major telecommunication networks. Holy God goggles, Batman. Take off your clothes. This is a hell of a thing. Considering her insistence he get naked to try on the suit is only in story service of giving Peter's rival something to use against him with MJ. But in addition to that, this should be creepy. It's played for laughs, but it's a grown woman demanding a teenager take off his clothes. You couldn't think of any better ways to give the rival leverage than this? Initiating strike. Initiating what now? Intercept point determined. Releasing kill vehicle. Peter has already played this game with his first Spidey suit Tony gave him. He should have known as soon as Edith said target, this is what he was asking her to do. Also, I don't care who Tony Stark is, it is insane to think he would just have a weaponized satellite in the sky that could be initiated by someone not understanding a question. I am no science guy, but I don't think that's how momentum works. Once Peter exits the vehicle, he still has forward momentum, but begins to immediately slow, comparable to the bus itself, which continues at the same speed. All I'm saying is Peter should either have landed back on on the roof of the van behind the opening or at least dinged the edge of the opening on his way back down. It's clear to me that you were not ready for this. To be fair, he told you that in Venice. Also, isn't this yet another rehash of Homecoming with Fury taking the place of Tony? Is this what we get to look forward to in all these MCU Spider-Man films? Someone will tell him he's not ready to fight the big fight and then he'll do it anyway and come out on top? It's like multiple versions of Rocky III. Lucky for us. We got the best seats in the house. From here on out, I'm shortening too much teacher to TMT. It will save me an entire syllable. And at this point, I will take every ounce of saved breath over this movie that I can get. I'll save you a seat next to me. Zendaya is adorable in this movie. But, well, all I'm saying is don't watch the entirety of Euphoria on HBO right before you watch her in this movie, because it will be a jarring juxtaposition. Also, jarring juxtaposition is also A, an edgier name in chef circles for the serpent turf, B, what my college girlfriend called sex, C, the name of my cousin's jazz core band, or D, one's perception of marriage prior to and immediately after the wedding ceremony. And Peter, whatever you do, please steer the monster away from the opera house. Yeah, Ned, I know. And now so does Betty, because she's right behind you and Ned is not using an inside voice. I would totally kiss you, but I think I just threw up in my mouth a little. You did? You threw up in your mouth a little? How do you not know for sure whether or not you threw up in your mouth? Here's where her dad from the nice guys would chide her. Don't say I think, just to fill space in a sentence. But also, there is not a teenage male alive that would let a little vomit get in the way of some action. The choice is yours. I hear you can get with this, or you can get with that. You can get with this, or you can get with that. You can get with this, or you can get with that. I think I'll get with this, because this is where it's at. This scene where Peter gives his god goggles to Mysterio willingly, his spidey f***ing sense failed him, bro. This movie makes it seem later like he's been struggling for a while with using the Peter Tingle, but other than that banana bull 
I can't find much early movie evidence of this, and I suspect it was largely left on the cutting room floor. Because maybe he didn't trust me to have Edith, he just trusted me to pick who should. I mean, maybe. But my guess is he wasn't expecting you to pick some rando you met a couple days ago. Peter might as well be giving the glasses to Flash. You stopped the elementals, you saved my life, you saved the world! Peter isn't this dumb, though. Like, I get that he's grieving Tony and maybe not at the top of his game, but even if the Spidey sense is f***ing him over, Peter's own brain should be ringing all the bells right now. Mr. Stark would have really liked you. Have you forgotten how good a judge of character Tony Stark was? He'd have seen through this asshole way back in Venice, and he would have hated a guy that pretends to be a hero through illusions rather than truly doing heroic stuff. To the man who brought us all together, our former boss, Tony Stark. And seriously, f*** you, Moomy. This is now two Spider-Man villains in a row that have been turned into essentially Iron Man villains that Spider-Man has to fight. Is it asking too goddamn much to have a Spider-Man movie be a f***ing Spider-Man movie? Maybe Sony should take this back over. Also, Mysterio is essentially the Mandarin all over again. A rather cool character who has literally been acting the whole time and is uninteresting as hell when his true colors shine. So way to go, Far From Home. You're the Iron Man 3 of Spider-Man movies. But also, world's longest toast ever. Oh, $611 million for my little therapeutic experiment. <laughs> I haven't seen this kind of sh character in the shadows retconning since the last Saw movie. Camp of Science, we're leaving because of witches. That's witchist. That's what it said on the news. And the news never lies. The news that the news never lies about the news is fake news. Oh, good thing MJ happened to be right by the drone projector that Peter caught in his webbing and they could have this awkward conversation on the bridge. Because then Peter would never find out Quentin Beck is a fake and a bad guy and f this movie relies on way too much coincidental coincidences. Wait a minute, does that mean that the elementals are fake? There was fire and destruction. Who would do something like that? Hmm, Peter, who would do that? God, this movie makes Peter Parker dumber than a box of rocks. I am trying to fool 7 billion people here, including Nick Fury, who happens to be the most paranoid and most dangerous person on the planet. Not true. The most paranoid person on the planet is clearly Kanye West. And the most dangerous person on the planet is clearly Kanye West. I realize he didn't have a lot of options since he can't fly and but that is a four and a half hour train ride he just took from Prague to Berlin. And I'm just saying, all the evil could be done already by the time he gets there, and I wouldn't be surprised. In case you confused it with Berlin, New Hampshire. I don't think you know what's real, Peter. Peter. I just can't give enough sins for this movie wants to excuse as the work of drones that could never be the work of drones. Add 10 now! I created Mysterio to give the world someone to believe in! You created Mysterio to be poison? If you were good enough. Maybe Tony would still be alive. But Tony's death in Endgame wasn't Peter's fault. Look, this sequence is visually arresting, and that's worth praise. But it's undercut by the knowledge that all of this is being done by drones, which is hilariously impossible. It's easy to fool people when they're already fooling themselves. What does that even mean? At least in the context of this movie. You fooled Peter just now because you have lookalike drones, not because Peter was out here f***ing up his own mind with needless quandaries. But for what it's worth, Peter, I really am sorry. Terrific train timing! When and how did they plan this? Okay, we'll come pick you up in the Netherlands. We'll meet you at the edge of that one large field of flowers. You're never gonna be Iron Man. Good, then for the love of God, skip! You're the head of security and your password is password? I, I don't feel good about it either. Movie has time for this. Oh, I love Led Zeppelin! How does a kid as pop culture savvy as Peter was in Infinity War and Homecoming mistake ACDC for Led Zeppelin? Or is the movie making a joke about his probable concussion? Okay, people, no Avengers coming. We're good to go. But why aren't any Avengers coming? Fury has already decided he can't rely on Spider-Man, so why couldn't he call someone? Falcon, Rhodey, Doctor Strange, Asbestos Lady? It's literally not a Spider-Man movie if his love interest isn't in danger and needing him to rescue them. Like the Power Rangers! You think he can Voltron? Who? Voltron! You think they were making all this up as they went about filming it? Be ready for anything. Then she went to the roof with a bazooka and saves him when the drone appears and is going to kill him. And I guess they knew about the drones already from Happy's warning? Regardless, I'm more curious how be ready for anything became shorthand for one of these drones is definitely going to show up outside this window and try and kill me, so you should go to the roof with a shoulder rocket. Edith, give me some protection. Copy. If Beck has Edith, I'm not sure why he even needs the drones anymore. He has an entire satellite of weaponry at his disposal to do whatever he wants. Can we get some villains with at least a little more creativity than the Batman Forever Riddler? That's all I ask. <laughs> this movie is a lot more Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom than I think they were going for. Happy, thank God! I bought us some time. And apparently some amazing earpieces. Happy and the kids are in a goddamn vault, still able to communicate with Peter. Spider-Man does some stuff, but I'm not honestly sure what any of it was. I'm sure it was awesome and devastating to the drones, but I'd need a transcript of the events to know what the f*** just happened. Gee, I wonder what this bridge is. It's London Bridge, right? Great. No webs. That seems unnecessary. He just started using this suit. He used up all his webbing already? Why do you have to strip him of one of his tools of the job in order for the finale to have stakes? Nobody dies on my watch. I mean, technically Iron Man did. How much of my life playing video games we're gonna die? I have a fake ID. 
and I've never even used it. This confession right before we die trope has been done before and to death, but probably never better than an almost famous. Okay, that was f***ing badass. Wow, Peter went from struggling with his Peter Tingle to seeing blind like Daredevil. And I'm calling bull sh If it was so easy, all he had to do was wish for it a little bit, then why the struggle to use it before now? You're in the strike zone. The chance of getting Don't hit is- FIRE ALL THE DRONES NOW! This guy is even dumber than Kent Mansley. Sorry, it's broken. I actually like it better broken. Of course you do. Are you sure no one else has figured it out? Yeah, I mean- it's not like anybody really pays attention to you. Secret identity shadowing. Hello, Gerald. Could mother not make it? Holy sh This is a dark final beat for Flash Thompson. Almost like they might be setting him up for something more antagonisty in the next installment. What is that on the white plate on the end table next to Aunt May? Is it sushi? A peppermint stick biscotti? A skinny breakfast burrito with ketchup drizzle on top? White chocolate pretzel with raspberry? Spider-Man attacked me for some reason. He has an army weaponized drone, Stark technology. But who's gonna believe all this? There should be tons of citizen and surveillance video of the Tower Bridge attack. London is one of the most heavily surveilled cities in existence, and Spider-Man clearly beat the hell out of some drones and shit. People will figure out the video is doctored even before all the video evidence is unearthed. This is some bull is my point. And here's J. Jonah Jameson, back now as an online news pundit, because I guess they felt the same way about J.K. Simmons in this role as they did James Earl Jones in the role of Mufasa, which is that no one could ever replace them. But it breaks continuity, pulls me out of the movie, and Carl Urban or Timothy Oliphant could have pulled off a slightly new, different take on the character just fine. Also, does this mean this movie is in the same universe as Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies? Because it kind of does, even though they will tell you it does not. So, Fury and Hill, all movie, were actually these two Klingons from the Captain Marvel movie. Bum, 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 but that's stupid. Fury's on vacation? What the f guys? This is lame. It also sort of suggests you might still end up doing that thing where anyone at any time in the NCU might be a scroll, which would be a huge cop out. Tony didn't die, it was scroll Tony! Dewey, I'm cutting half pretty bad. In case y'all don't make it, then you have to be double great. Claw. It's becoming a claw! Look at me. Me. Everybody dies. Not every man really lives. Is he breathing? Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. I chose my people. But I don't want your life. Who led him to the heart-shaped herb. Is that what I think it is? Mm hmm It's beautiful. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. I feel the need, the need for speed. We happy? Vincent! Yeah, we happy. Your father and I were just discussing his day at work. Why don't you tell our daughter about it, honey? Janie, today I quit my job. <laughs> and then I told my boss to go f himself, and then I blackmailed him for almost $60,000 past the asparagus. Your father seems to think this kind of behavior is something to be proud of. And your mother seems to prefer that I go through life like a f***ing prisoner while she keeps my d in a mason jar under the sink. Tell the Supreme Intelligence that I'm coming to end it. You tell them I'm coming! And hell's coming with me, you hear? You're too fast! You need to go slow! I wanna go fast! Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? The universe required correction. I corrected her. Careful. Look out for each other. Be excellent to each other. And party on, dudes! Chili. He dives at me in a pussy-like fashion. Poor planning. Poor execution. Clint, where's Nat? He fell. Okay. I'm okay to go. I'm okay to go. Excited about the science trip? Hey, uh, yeah, we're just talking about the trip. You guys are losers. But then why do you sit with us? Because I don't have any friends. You should probably download a VPN on your phone just so that the government can't track you while we're abroad. Will do. She's got the crazy eyes. I want to ride the pony. Because I thought that was just theoretical. I mean, that completely changes how we understand the initial singularity. We're no!
The battle station is heavily shielded and carries a firepower greater than half the Starfleet. I'm sorry, did you say Prague? Oh, I've been to Prague. Well, I haven't been to Prague, been to Prague, but I know that thing. I know that stop shaving your armpits, read the unbearable lightness of being, fall in love with a sculptor, now I realize how bad American coffee is thing. I'm Peter Parker. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. It's the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Together we burn the village! Burn the village! And, uh, raped the horses! Then everyone will listen! The King of the North!